Chapter 11. But you have the bowl back. Just because I wasn't the one to bring it back, doesn't mean it doesn't still count. Just be thankful I'm not going to charge you extra. People showing up here with 50 bowls at a time is messing up my workflow. What workflow? She huffs and gets me a double portion of food. It's the same as yesterday, rabbit stew with a big piece of bread. I pay without saying anything else and leave looking over my messages. You have increased your constitution by plus one. You have increased your dexterity by plus one. You have increased your kinetic meditation skill by three levels. Kinetic meditation level 20. You have increased your blacksmith skill by two levels. Blacksmith level 6. You have increased your mana manipulation skill by two levels. Mana manipulation level 3. You have gained 53 EXP by making a basic dagger. I enter the guild hall and head to a corner to transcribe and give a summary of whatever is new in my book. As I look through it, I'm glad to see a couple of possible avenues to infusing materials. For now, all I can do is to infuse my body. Even body infusion doesn't actually do anything. There are also two new runes, but instead of simple concepts as before, like a fire rune, they seem to be connectors. I'm probably going to need them if I want to make more complex spells. This time, less than a page is filled out. But I can clearly see the value in this information. With some experimentation, I can start infusing wood. And even if the time is not here yet, this is all ground I will have to cover. Might as well get a head start. I deliver a neat page written, with a better charcoal stick than what I had seen yesterday, to the guild scribe. The guy was using my pin, but I didn't begrudge him. We really needed to stick together. Letting it sit on my pocket the entire day would be a waste. He gives me the only copy of the book the guild bought. After I finish along with two other people reading from my sides I read the license for the book. The book goes into some more depth on stats but only at the start. After that, it becomes basically useless. On the license, I look through the rules about showing the book to other people and reading the book. After some, though, we could have classrooms with someone teaching the contents of the book without risking infringing the license terms. We just need to pay attention to students taking notes. Something that is not covered would be to use a camera to remotely show someone the book. That seems to be allowed. You just can't record the stream or take pictures. It might be possible to get the magical equivalent of a camera. I carefully look through the penalties. Most violations just make you lose the license, and I'm glad for that. Penalties for continuing to use the book are quite vague, but I doubt there is nothing to worry about. The council and interested parties would probably want the harshest possible penalties. The scribe says to me, So, did you have a productive session? I think so. I got another couple of ideas tumbling up here. I say pointing at my head. Good, we need more of those. One of my ideas might need a steady supply of wood. Just let us know. Also, there is a new paper production place we are setting up. We have run into some problems. The guy in charge actually worked at a paper factory, but he was used to industrial equipment. You gave the idea, so I thought you might have some insight. I'm not sure how valuable my insight would be. I made five pages of paper in my life, and I was only happy with one of them. Then you have more experience than anyone else in the village handcrafting paper. If you weren't doing so much good in the smith, along with your contribution hunting, we might ask you to take over the paper production. For now, your day is full enough. Where is this production? East, out by the back of the town hall. You can't miss it. We set it up a couple of the houses there. I finish everything up and return the damn bowl to the innkeeper myself. Going to where I slept, I hear a couple people working. Going closer, I realize it's three people. Looking over the operation, I'm impressed. A large cooking pot, a fire, big water tubs all filled. Would stack neatly and divided in their types and colors. Approaching, I speak. Hey, the guild sent me. They say I might be of help getting things started. Who? Yes. We need all the help we can get. Do you have any experience? I made a couple of sheets of paper years ago. That is why I gave paper as an example of an industry we could get started on. It wasn't a perfect job, and it would be more expensive to do it. But the way I know works. Well, tell me how you did it. We have a good part of the process already figured out, but the industrial process of making the sheets is not something we can replicate. I figure, what have you been using as a screen? He pulls a rough frame from behind him and shows me. We bought silk cloth and made a frame. It's expensive, but if it makes good paper, it will be worth it. Even if we have to make a dozen of these, it will still be worth it. The problem is that it takes hours for the water to stray. Also, after it does, we haven't been able to separate the paper without ruining it. Have you thought of using cheaper cloth? Maybe what you might find in a floor cleaning cloth. The ones with thick string and a weave so loose you can see the other side. 
Won't the half the cellulose go right through and make getting the paper even harder without ruining it? You just need to wait to dry. The paper is not perfect, but it is serviceable. Okay, I'm gonna give it a try. And with this method we can just buy more frames, maybe even set up a hot box to dry then faster after straining. Good idea. You got this in the bag. Maybe I can also find some way to flatten the paper. I know you can do it after you separate from the screen. You just have to do it before drying. With smooth rollers. That part I'm quite familiar with. Are you going to be staying? No, I'm leaving to explore the forest. Thanks for stopping by then. Just be careful. Unagin is filled with good ideas. We can't have you being wolves, chow. Don't worry. I say my goodbyes to both the former paper man and his helper. I laugh at how small my contribution was. He just needed a sounding board with a head on their shoulders. He has a better handle on making paper on his pinky finger than I have on my entire body. He just has never made any paper by hand and is overwhelmed. His helper also doesn't strike me as someone with too much initiative. Not a bad worker, just someone that doesn't have too many original ideas. If they need to stop every time a small problem shows up, work never gets done. You need someone able to solve at least small problems on the fly. I have to keep an eye on the paper production. If everything goes well, it will be a long-term expense basically eliminated, and we will be able to make copies of at least my books. With care, we might even include most of the information we learn from the books we buy. We will have to be very careful about what we write down, but it is a good avenue. If we make sure everything has a secondary source and experiments, the copyright rules will not cause us to lose the licenses to the books. New and independent knowledge will obviously be written down. I realize I unwittingly helped to bring back the means to a bureaucratic society, but if it comes to that I just need to burn down the paper mill. Not really a paper mill, but I don't care. On my head and I can call it whatever I want. I laugh out loud, almost like an evil cackle. I laugh and laugh and head outside the village. The guard doesn't stop me and just waves me through. There are two guild guards that open and close the gate as I pass without any fuss. I don't even have to slow down. They are both armed one with a short sword and the other with a spear. The weapons I saw being bought earlier must have been mostly guild affairs. Seems, as they are posted there, they have taken to be as helpful as possible to the people going out. Only a few seconds behind me I see a group of four leaving and one of them is also carrying a weapon. Not just the guild them, people have gathered their money to start outfitting themselves. I slow my pace and let them catch up. Hey, are you going out alone? Yeah, I'm used to it. Come on man. We know you have magic, but don't risk yourself unnecessarily. You should at least get some shoes. I might join a group, but I'm used to the woods. I probably spend more time in the forest than a good portion of the village combined. I lived in a small cot besides Pando. Also, don't talk about shoes. I have gotten so used to going shoeless. By now I worry my feet might fall off if I try to put them on. So you were some kind or mountain hermit? Not so much. I just lived on Pando. At two of their confused faces, the girl carrying the sword says, The magical forest. It's somewhere in the United States. Utah, says the teenager in the back. Oh, didn't know it had a name. Of course it had a name. The boy asks curiously, Is it true there is magic there? I mean before this, but now. Yes. One day I might tell you guys. I say with a bit of mystery. That ends conversation for a moment and we all increase the pace. I found a suitable tree to make another staff. This time it is still standing. It isn't very dry, but it also is not green wood. I quickly cut it and clean the staff. In less than half an hour I find tracks from a wolf pack. Three wolves, I would guess. Do you guys want to follow the track? Sure. Better than wandering around waiting to be ambushed. The biggest of the group who has been silent to this point says. I agree. We all follow the tracks carefully. I stop occasionally to make sure we are going the right way and to look for signs and places with several converging tracks. In 20 minutes, we run into the wolves. I see three, just like I expected. They are already turning around and preparing to attack us. Seeing the big group, they just headed straight into attack. Ugly mufflers, says the younger of the group. I position myself in the forward position, waiting to flank the wolves as well as I can. They head straight at me. I position myself with a wide pose lowering my center of gravity. When they are almost at me, I jump aside putting my staff in front of me to defend me from any of the wolf attacks. The wolf to the right has sought time to turn to my new position and I brace myself as he hits my staff. I pull my staff to the side and back hitting him in the head with the butt of it, as if I was wielding a spear. He tumbles but gets up immediately. 
I spare a moment to pay more attention to the other wolves and see if the group is having difficulty with them. They have good coordination and seem to be managing just fine. I slowly maneuver the fight. In a few exchanges, I'm turned in the direction the whole group is fighting. The wolf has his back to everybody but me. I focus on making him give up. I hit him in the head a few times but focus mostly on the body. With only a single wolf, I don't get a single scratch and in five minutes they manage to kill one of the wolves. Both of the remaining wolves then retreat without much fanfare. Holy shit. That was awesome. I was like, Wan, and you like, Rowu, and the wolves just like, run away. Man, that was like, so epic. Hunting rabbits doesn't compare. The teenager says, all excited. The leader gets the corpse of the wolf and throws it in his back. Should we come back to the city? We need to figure it out if anyone wants the wolf. It looks ugly, but it might be worth something. The woman answers. They might want it for the bones and sinew. Maybe even the skin if the tanner knows some magic for making this into useful leather. You guys go ahead. I will stay a little longer. I say, don't you want your share? Don't worry about it. The woman says, you do like you can handle yourself. I grin without saying anything and set out at my normal pace. From their perspective, however, I'm doing a half-mile sprint. I think about our relative power. They may be in the 7 to 9 average stat points range. Their fighting experience, however, takes them to another level of danger. I settle at a comfortable pace I can maintain the rest of the time, but also push myself. I need those stat points. Looking at my messages, I am a bit surprised. You have gained EXP plus 475. EXP 752-1000. You have gained plus 1 agility. You have gained plus 1 dexterity. You have increased your staff mastery by plus 2. Staff mastery level 2. Only a few minutes and my stats are going up like crazy. I'm gonna be Superman in no time. Too bad there is a soft cap on stat increase through this method. And I already reached this soft cap with my endurance. No, I didn't just reach it. I surpassed it. I'm over the soft cap by only a single point but it hasn't increased since my integration in the system. Out of all my physical stats, endurance was what I most focused over the years. Sometimes I spend hours or even days on tasks without a break. Tasks most would have given up in minutes. I wonder how high I could push myself. I felt that getting a 25 in endurance without having to compromise on any of the other stats was within reasonable expectations. About the mental stats, I knew they could be pushed higher, but their progression was also slower. I wondered if what I learned from the book today was all it would be discussed tomorrow. After some thought, I filed the whole line of thought away and concentrated on the hunt and exploration. In that moment, I felt like the primitive man going out to gather food for his family more than ever before. Chapter 12 It takes me an hour to run into another wolf pack. I'm lucky and this pack has only two wolves. That means I can experiment a bit more. I leave my staff on the ground and advance on them. Without the range the staff provides, I need to be more careful. The bigger wolf attacks first with a head on charge, while the other tries to flank me. I use every vestige of speed in my body, and I grab the wolf by his throat. He snarls and tries to scratch me, but I pull him up and throw him. I almost hit the other wolf. He rolls on the ground with grace, and the other wolf goes for my own throat. I push his head to the side, and he goes rolling like the first wolf. They try different things, and I get a few scratches, but nothing too deep. These wolves don't have claws too dangerous, but their sheer strength is enough to hurt me. At 20 constitution, I would probably not even need to worry about their claws. That is assuming stat scale like I expect them to. I spend a good 20 minutes just playing with the wolves, but they are getting more desperate. I study their patterns, their breathing, and their preferred moves. How they organize themselves. I change the way I move to see how they react. By the end, I'm starting to understand how they think. That helps me in conserving a lot of energy. I could keep this up all day. The wolves, however, have ragged breaths and they are not pressing me as hard. I start to throw them farther and farther until both of them give up and retreat. I find another two packs, each with three, and I play with them. I know that any of them would kill me in an instant given the chance, but I don't hold that against them. Each encounter further convinces me that they are not inherently bad. There is something that is forcing them into this state. Perhaps an alpha that commands them to attack everyone. It could also be a disease. System interference? I then have a distasteful thought. It may be council interference. It would be just like the council to infect animals to do their bidding. I occasionally get my staff to use it during the fights. I need the familiarity of using a weapon. It is good practice for pole weapons, like spears and pole axes. Perhaps my future weapon would be some sort of staff. 
With those thoughts on my mind, I started tread my track back to the city. I stopped by a tree with the characteristic as I was looking for. I saw and stab the six inches thick trunk with my dagger. When I get to an inch and a half, I cut off most of the branches. Mentally preparing myself, I ran and hit both my feet in the middle of the tree pushing with all my strength. I may love to run barefoot, but once in a while I do something it would be better while using shoes. After a second run the tree is down and I'm sawing the last few fibers from the foot of the tree. I balance the 200-pound tree on my shoulder and I'm running back. A mile away from the village, I hear people and head in their direction. They are carrying back another wolf and I talk to them. Hey, did you came back to the city already? No, but we heard the tanner was buying the wolf for their skin. It's only half price of a healthy wolf, but it is better than nothing. How much? Two copper I would guess for this wolf. The tanner needs to see then. You know to appraise the quality and size. Is it worth hunting wolves for that reward? Definitely. The money aside, we actually get good EXP for the kills. They net an average of 500 to 700 for a single kill. And the wolves that escape net at least 200 each. I already hit level 3. 2000 EXP just for 6 hours of hunting. The other two guys also got over 1000 EXP each. That is over a day hunting rabbits. And that is taking into account we spend time bringing the wolves back to the city. This is our third one already. You guys could just fight the wolves until they flee. Here just a minute. I go through my messages quickly. You have gained 712 EXP. You have gained 1062 EXP. You have gained 1041 EXP. EXP 567 slash 3000. You have increased your Staff Mastery skill by one level. Staff Mastery LV.3. You have increased your level. Level 2. You have 2 free stat points. You have gained plus 1 agility. You have gained plus 2 constitution. I think just for a moment, but I leave the reflection for later and continue speaking. I got 350 EXP average per wolf. And I did not kill a single one. You were kinder than me. And a better fighter, we can't play around these wolves. And these mutts are too ugly to let be. They are not ugly. There is something wrong with them. I'm going to figure it out. I feel another message, this time with a stronger mental chime. As usual, I ignore it until I have the time to look over them properly or I have reason to look over them. It's an idea, but we also need the money, so for now it's a moot point. That said, I heard speculation that if we aren't careful we could kill off the population or flood the market until they are only worth a copper by the dozen. I also have that concern. Humans have a gift to interfere with whole ecosystems. It seems we can't just let things be. You are one to talk, Mr. Fancy Pants. I'm so in connection with nature. I don't even wear shoes. I see him grinning and I join in the joke. With my most pompous and arrogant voice I can make I say, I will have you know, I have a guiding hand in three of the most significant organizations trying to end exploitation of natural resources. Whoa, I see. I see. But, aren't you the founder of the biggest mining conglomerate of South America? Somebody has to do it. Better be a conscientious person like me. I agree. That is better. I see that you really care but I heard about the accusations that you have funded protests and petitions against other companies for your own financial gain. All unfounded and slanderous accusations that were started by my opponents. Everyone laughs at that for they know that people in power do whatever they want as long as they can get away with it. Their large checkbooks and people protecting them are powerful tools being misused. A young man comes to my other side, passing below the tree I'm carrying. Damn, you don't even change shoulders. This log is huge. It must weigh more than you. Your strength stat must be through the roof. It is good enough. What you need is endurance to carry a log like this. In no time you will be able to carry twice as much. Damn right. I will. We get to the gates and are let in. We say our goodbyes and I head to my sleeping spot. I think about my gains. I manage to level twice. For now I will probably not be able to keep up with the highest levels. But as leveling speed slows and I have my economic base figured out, I will be able to dedicate more time to hunting. Or I could make it more efficient, somehow. I have heard of someone hitting level 4 today in the afternoon. By now they might even be level 5. From my sleeping spot, I check the closest empty house and mark it as occupied. I break a couple of branches off and leave them and my staff in the room. That way no one will mistake it for an abandoned unit. I leave the log partially outside because it is too long. I take one of the longer branches and break it off in several pieces against my leg. Sitting in my meditation position, I send my mana into the piece of wood. What I find a bit surprising is that this wood reacts to my mana slightly. I try a couple of different things and put all the resulting pieces of wood over a flame. 
All of them are green wood, but the reaction does seem to be the opposite of my goal. The results are that the better I integrate the mana throughout the wood, the harder it is to burn it. I discovered a critical step in the journey to infusing wood. Probably the last step. Now, I need to find the right type of mana and maybe add intent so the mana knows how to act. I pull the mana from my most successful experiment, and it seems different from before. Just like the mana I recover as I burn wood. This, however, is a different type of mana. Possibly nature mana, or earth, or life. It could also be a different type of mana entirely, or a combination. With my mana pool slowly dwindling, I find some scrap wood to burn and have the most expensive part of this endeavor taken care of. I cut the dry wood in thinner strips with my knife and slowly add wood to the fire. I try to extract mana while the wood is burning, but it doesn't go well. I manage to extract some mana back at a rate of 1 to 20. When I put that mana in the wood, I get even better results than Mr. Blackwood's firewood. The wood, even wet burns at about 10 times the rate. The temperature could be better, but given the water content, I'm happy with the experiment. I suppose the higher density of mana allowed it to burn even hotter than at the forge. The problem is the efficiency. I only had enough mana regeneration to make one of these per hour. I slowly go through the wood branches I cut off from the tree. I start to have success when I use a method that is an intermediary between actually infusing the wood and just pushing my mana on the wood as I was originally doing. I managed to get a 1 to 5 efficiency. Probably would have gotten even better with more time to refine my approach. After a while, I also noticed the effect my skill level increase has. I may have a much higher control than expected given how similar mana manipulation is to doing the same exercises with ether. But that is only my initial impression. After closer examination, I noticed that mana is actually easier to manipulate. It has a physical quality that is hard to ignore once you become aware of it. Ether, on the other hand, is completely ethereal. It cannot be physically manipulated. It goes through anything without noticing it's there. Coming from first learning about mana to ether would be a whole different beast. I already got past the initial stumbling block. Now I just need to get used to the quirks of mana. Finishing up, I gather my things and clean the spot. I leave and go in the direction of the river. Taking a bath and washing my clothes, I enter the city soaked. I go to the smithy with all the branches I didn't use. I look at the sky and see it's about 2 a.m. After entering, I place the wood in the forge, light them in fire, and sit by the side of the mana input plate. I place my hand on it and send as little mana as possible. Instead of focusing on a smooth flow, I focus on sending an ever-diminishing supply of mana. I enter a meditative state as profound as I can while balancing the act of sending as little mana as possible with making it as continuous as I can. The small disturbances are confusing in my efforts to take the shape of the machine in my mind, but the smaller mana flow seemed to help me picture it better. I don't pay attention to the close details, and in my mind an image is ever so slowly revealing itself. Maybe in a week with training I might be able to look at it well enough I could draw it. After a while I reach equilibrium. I take a quick look and I am sending one mana every 18 seconds. When I start I only have 32 mana so it only takes 10 minutes to exhaust myself. I keep at it until my mana almost runs out and then I go to sleep. I just lay back and I'm snoring away. Back on Earth, Pando sees the third attack on his domain. A season has gone by since all the moving beings went away. This season he was hard at work not letting a single second go by without doing his utmost to prepare himself. In this wave, locusts came flying and quickly started to eat his smaller branches in the most damaging way possible. Soon all the locusts start to drop to the ground dead. Their insides being poisoned, they don't last more than a few seconds. Not a single one that took more than a bite survived. The forest is peaceful again. Time to grow. Time to defend. Time to feed. Chapter 13 Waking up before the sun is up, I leave the shop and go to the inn to get some food. I have really pushed my meals in the last two days, and I know my body is going to start demanding I eat, as I exercise more and more. I get some fruit and cornbread. At least they have some variety. I eat at the mostly empty salon without being charged anything extra. Some variety in my diet does lift my mood a little. Still, with no wild berries in the forest, it's not the same. There is so much that looks like old earth, but it is actually a completely different world. All the plants are facsimile of what we had on earth. Everything from the trees, to the food, the rocks, the soil. They are all small differences, but it's noticeable for someone attentive. Before returning to the smithy, I get the tree I cut from the forest. Finding an axe in the back of the shop, I cut the trunk in manageable pieces. I return half of it to my room, and pile the rest on a corner of the forge. 
Still not being time to light the forge, I start to meditate again. The sun goes up and I wait half an hour. I use a few points of mana to light the fire and put another couple of points in the machine at a rate of 10 seconds per point of mana. In less than a minute I'm done and I go back to meditating. The forge slowly heats up, given the wood inside is not infused and most of it is still green. I carefully place the wood inside so the dry wood will burn under the green one and the whole thing works. There is just more smoke than normal. When I hear people going to the town square, I cover the mouth of the forge. That way I'm certain the whole forge won't somehow burn down. It's one of the few buildings in town mostly made of stone, but better safe than sorry. I was already tempting fate with my drying room. I get to the square as the mayor starts his speech, but it is only fluff and a few details we already read from my book. The meeting afterwards also doesn't bring news to me. So I quickly leave and come back to the forge. Getting there I start to pile the wood in so when Mr. Blackwood gets here the forge is ready for him, or at least close to it. In only 10 minutes I hear him open the door. I'm in the middle of getting the tools to the place he likes them. Hon, boy are you causing mischief? No. I just lit the forge and I'm putting everything in place so you can start working. Good. I see you have a new dagger on your belt. Can I assume you made it yourself? Yes. It's a basic but solid tool. I can see that. Keep up the good work. The other workers get to the smithy as we are talking and start to help. Mr. Blackwood looks at the inside of the forge and says, Did you put greenwood in it? Don't you know that lowers the temperature? I only put a little on the edges, just enough to help heat up the forge. All the rest is proper infused wood. Well, good initiative. Did you have any success infusing wood? Some. The efficiency is still quite bad, but I'm getting there. I need a little more experimentation to get me to a point where I would be comfortable spending all my mana like this. Good. I knew you had potential. Given a week, and you might already be good enough to make plenty of wood. I think that he is underestimating me, but I don't correct him. We go on at the same pace as yesterday, maybe slightly faster. By midday, Mr. Blackwood has let me use his hammer a little to start shaping a couple of the weapons he makes. He gives me advice on how to hold the hammer, on what to concentrate, how to think about the metal shaping. I think about why he has already let me begin to forge. He probably thought that since I'm good enough to make a dagger, I can start to get some practice. Come on, master, let me at least hold the hammer. You let him make half the stuff today, says a whining brat. He's always complaining about something. Today he has chosen to annoy the smith. Not your master, and as I told you before, no. But master, it isn't fair. He gets to increase his skill level while we don't even have the skill. How much time outside your work have you spent forging? What, he says, and without realizing the faux pas he is about to commit, he continues. None. I already spent the entire day here where I should be learning to forge. Not that I learn anything. Then you are doing something wrong. The day you show up here with something you have forged on your own, I will let you help me with more than grunt work. We don't even have the time to go to the bathroom or stop to eat lunch. And how can I do that, if you won't teach me? Dismiss your preconceptions and learn on your own. If you pay for the wood and metal, you can forge anything you want. And if you need to eat, just tell me, I'm not your mother. Brad just grumbles. Everyone says they want to get something to eat, so he leaves with them. I stay and continue helping as well as I can. So aren't you going to eat? Your species seems to prefer eating three to five times a day. My species. I say having confirmed my suspicion that they may look human but are not. On a different note, I continue. I only eat once or twice a day. I have eaten today. Hume. So you are an outlier. Well, it is not like I couldn't see it. Hell, you don't even use shoes. With a big grin on my face, I say. Not my fault. The system didn't give me shoes when I came here. So unfair I didn't get shoes. Everybody else can have their feet all warm and cozy in their shoes while I get to rough it out. Why do I get the impression you don't actually care? Maybe it is the fact I haven't seen you rub your foot a single time. And it's not like you slack off. You work twice as hard as anybody else here. I'm not used to giving half effort to anything I put my mind to. Some would say I'm obsessive. You were driven. Now it's time to train your mana control. Just like yesterday. Send as little mana as you can into the input plate. I sit, place my hand on the input and start meditating. I send a smaller trickle of mana than yesterday, but still more than my minimum. I measure about one mana every 15 seconds. I start the endeavor nonchalantly, but soon I'm getting deeper and deeper. I focus absolutely and let everything else fall away. The world does not exist. All that exists is the flow, and the flow is all. Smooth. Smooth. Time goes by. Everyone is back from their lunch. Work is back at full steam, and I keep going without even noticing. 
I even get a bump on my head. I don't feel anything, but a certain douchebag has a big grin on his face. The smithy isn't here to give everything spoon-fed to you. The guild people stop by. They buy tools and equipment. With five silver, they get at least one of everything, except the arrow tips. It makes economic sense. A bow along with everything that it needs, cost over a silver. It is also more fragile and requires more skill to wield effectively. It could be good when our budget isn't so tight and we can afford it. Especially as a secondary weapon. Shooting with a bow, or a crossbow, and finishing it off with a melee weapon. Over an hour later, I'm deeper than ever before in my pando meditation. I can sense something almost at my grasp. Something elusive and undefined, but as I'm reaching out to it, I'm wrenched out of meditation. A powerful voice bellows and I'm up. That is enough. We can't have you fainting of mana depletion. You already heated up the forge enough I could make this baby. He says this as he shows a gleaming longsword. I inspect it, and for the first time, I see its stats. Well-made basic sword. Increase attack by plus three. This is the first plus three weapon I see. The ones on the walls are way out of our range, but this is probably within the guild's budget. Curious, I ask the price and the answer surprises me. Normally, I charge three silver for a weapon this good. Given you helped me save the coal I would have to use. Two silver. Damn, more expensive than I was hopping. Still, it's 50% more damage with a weapon that is already longer and heavier. That thing could do some damage. The thing would provide a massive EXP boost at the start if someone managed to find enough monsters to kill. Someone with some tracking skill and that and could handle a pack of wolves alone would be leveling like crazy. I think over what happened and I reach the conclusion that this progression only happened because of my contribution. It's like he couldn't have done it before. The problem seemed to be system-imposed limitations. He could only work so fast depending on how many people he had helping. Now I discover that the upper limit of equipment depends on the forge's temperature. The little mana he provides the blower with is only enough to barely melt the steel. Steel seems to be the most basic metal he works on. The temperature must not have increased too much. Simply increasing it by a bit must have been enough he could make this blade. It seems, the longer you keep your metal hot, the worse the performance. Thinking over his habits, I do notice he tends to roughly shape the weapon as fast as he can and spends a longer time on the grinding stones finishing his work. It's not that keeping the metal hot was actually good, but on Earth we focused more on the final quenching instead of work time. Perhaps this is another difference from the way things are done here. Possibly some magic aspect I'm unaware of. As we start to wind down at the end of the day, I think that perhaps when we get more of the village outfitted, we could get a couple of magic users to run the blower around the clock. Maybe increasing the mana infused would be another way to achieve this. If the other apprentices learned magic, we could all contribute and have the forge working around the clock as well. I talk about a couple of new insights I have, and all of them pay close attention. One of them even shows me he gained mana manipulation. Unlike the other days, the blacksmith pays every one early and at my turn he shows me 12 coppers. This is for you going the extra mile today. I take only two coppers and say, Thank you. I will want two ingots today. He chuckles and pockets the money. Two others get an ingot each and stay with me. The others, tired from a whole day at work, leave. Jack and Leeway stand there while the smith says, This time, you guys can use a couple of wood locks. You can also use the scrap wood and the leftover leather for the handles. You can thank Nash for having heated the forge with what he brought himself. Next time you either use the unburned scraps or pay for the wood. Yes, they both agree. I show them how I work and forge an axe head. As I went to the grinding stone, they fumbled a bit but managed to get started on a dagger like mine. They may not have had any experience with blacksmithing beforehand, but they are earnest and I see they have paid close attention to the smith's work. I continue to work and soon I'm finished. Seeing them struggling, I help them a bit. The dagger is turning out well. They have prospects as blacksmiths. We are going to need that going forward. I later make a shovel using the rest of the second ingot and fit both of them with handles. I use the same scrap what I used for my pin. Finishing everything, we all leave. Both of them now have daggers on their belts. We say our goodbyes and I head to the general store. I see another person in the store working with the owner. The line is shorter and only minutes before it closes I get a bucket. With my purchase I head to the river. Before leaving the city, I grab a loaf of bread at the inn and eat it on my way over. I find a place with some mud that should be good for what I have in mind. After collecting the mud and rocks I carried everything to my room. I pass by the guild and ask about the room next to mine. They say I can use it and they will mark it as industry. I start digging. 
I dig a pit and a channel under the room and break the wood on the other side. I put the rock in place with mud around then. I break the rock on the opposite side but leave a smaller hole. After three hours I finish all the work. It doesn't look pretty, but now I have a place to dry my wood. I lit a fire to extract mana and slowly infuse the mana in the logs I brought last night. I cut them even more to help them dry faster. I stack the few I got over the hole leaving as much space for air circulation as possible. Without much effort I get the equivalent of tin logs measuring against the wood from the blacksmith. Even with just the hot air, they shouldn't take more than one or two days to dry. After that the money will come in by the bucket load. Wahahaha. My evil plans are coming to fruition. I spend the rest of the night just going back and forth to the forest bringing wood. I take a few of the dying trees to use as fuel. And the green wood is stacked apart. I infuse and cut some of the green wood. My mana runs out as I hit about 60 logs worth. I make the fire bigger and go to sleep. This time I slept in a familiar place, my favorite tree in this village. Just before I nod off, I go over my messages. You have increased your mana manipulation skill by three levels, mana manipulation level 8. You have increased your kinetic meditation skill by one level, kinetic meditation level 21. You have increased your carrying skill by one level, carrying level 14. You have increased your running skill by one level, level 29. You have increased your blacksmithing skill by three level, level 9. You have acquired unarmed combat, unarmed combat level 2. You have upgraded Mana Infusion to Mana Infusion Level 0. Mana Infusion. You can now infuse materials. You have increased your Strength stat by plus 1. You have increased your Dexterity stat by plus 1. You have gained 272 EXP from manufacturing 2 items. Chapter 14. The sun starts peeking over the horizon and I get up. There is so much to do today. I prepare myself for the day. I eat. Place more wood in the pit of the drying room and get to the forge early with some scraps of dry wood. I lit the forge to preheat it. After organizing the forge for the day ahead, I go to the meeting. The mayor this time has some new information and I pay attention. The system has existed since time immemorial. Nobody is really sure who created it, but some suggest it was an effort from a group of the most powerful people of the time. We have accurate records from the last 14 billion years. The system, however, seems to be at least 40 billion years old. Changes have been observed in the system over the years. However, the system we know seems to be fairly similar from what was in place from as far back as we have records. It is considered extremely rude to inspect someone without their consent and duels to the death have been known to occur. In the tutorial, inspection of other people has been disabled as to provide a more amenable environment and not prejudice the new people to the eyes of the original settlers. The Council has been a stabilizing force to the multiverse and improved the culture level of many more war-minded nations. It has been in existence for 13 billion years, and many a claim it will continue for just as long. There is quite a bit of useless stuff there, but I extract what is useful from it. I can't be sure how much of it is true. At least I will know key pieces of information they want to pass as truth as I find sources to credit their accounts or disprove it. Without losing time, Charlie goes up and starts. Good morning everyone. I have a few announcements to make. We are very happy to inform everyone our industrial efforts have begun to bear some fruit. There is nothing industrial about it, yet, but we are hard at work to ensure every single person's work is the most effective possible. There have been stumbling blocks, but we are doing our best, and we have begun to the fruits. Today we had about 200 paper sheets done, and will soon increase production to 500 per day. That is one silver coin saved every day. The work at the COD is one of the most important industries for now, but we will be opening more soon as time and effort bear fruit. We can also easily scale production to export the material to other villages. A second industry we have put into place is the textile one. For now, we are only buying cloth and using it to make simple clothes. We will attempt to make cloth, but our initial impression is that it is not practical at this time. Our technology and know-how fall far too short. We will be selling them for approximately three copper apiece instead of the five copper from the general store. The starting clothes seem to be quite resilient, but fighting has damaged them and some people have taken to walking around almost naked. We are in trying times and it is not our intent to tell anyone how to live their lives. Few people have the money to keep buying clothes every day. Now there is a cheaper option that comes with a reasonable repair policy. You can also contract the people working for the seamstress to repair your starting clothes. Last but not least, I would like to inform all that while most have been more than generous, some have neglected to contribute to the guild. 
We understand the concerns of those that have brought this to our attention, and we are keeping a close track of all the contributions. We have begun to consider all physical coin donations and other kinds of donations that we receive, the equivalent of buying war bonds. Given our unique circumstances, he chuckles and gestures around, we have settled on a 1% flat interest rate per day. That may change in the future, but it will not reduce the value of the bonds you hold. Anyone can check how much they have contributed and the expected payout. If anyone wants documentation in paper, they can pay a one copper fee to get a physical copy of your bond. This bond can be updated as the person further contributes. We will only start to pay as our economy hits its stride, and that could take a little while. We think this a fair system, and we urge everyone to contribute as much as possible, especially right now. We are in the most critical stage, as our operations are starting to ramp up. Now, that is all for today. The crowd disperses, and I approach. Charlie is talking to an assistant, or a passenger, I assume. A young girl, she is probably 12 or 13 years old. That about the youngest I have seen around. The system perhaps requires a minimum age to integrate or at least send them in the tutorial. He fishes speaking with her, and I step up. Hey, I want to talk to you for a minute. Do you have the time? Sure. Fire away. I got an idea for an industry. And that idea is actually close to being feasible. It also helps with multiple of our problems. Some of it is. Come on, just spit it out. Selling wood to the blacksmith. We thought about it, but we don't have magical wood. And we also can't wait months for wood to dry. We are getting away with using dead wood to boil paper and a couple of other things, but I doubt the blacksmith would accept it. I worked around both problems. The wood is in an enclosed room that I keep quite hot. I dug a pit under it and am keeping a fire burning. Not sure how long it will take to dry, and it might be bad to build anything with it. Given it's going to be burned anyway, structural integrity and grain alignment or whatever is not a concern. And about the magical properties? I got a handle on that as well. It took me a while, but I managed to infuse wood with magic and it works. For now it isn't very mana efficient, but I can get 50 to 60 logs with my entire pool. That's about 50 copper per day. Over one silver if I spend my mana on nothing else. That's, he pauses for a moment to think. That is wonderful. That's another money stream. It prevents money from accumulating in the pockets of the blacksmith and keeps it in circulation. It might also speed up his production of weapons. Exactly, and it might let us see a few more powerful weapons if we concentrate more mana on a few locks. Yesterday, when I helped the forge get hotter, he produced a plus three longsword. That's an excellent weapon. It would be a boom to anyone wielding it. It could provide a massive EXP boost to a few of our hunters more suited to a longsword. My thoughts exactly. Given my help, we got a discount from three silver to two. The normal process would be to use coal, which is more expensive. My guess is that the system limits his fuel use, so for now he can't use coal. Okay. I will be going there as soon as we finish here to buy this sword. Let's go. We head to the smithy at a brisk pace. So how would we work out the logistics? For now, just make sure every hour someone passes by the house and puts more wood in the fire. Make sure it's someone who knows how not to screw up a fire. I don't want it burning down anything or going out. Later we will need to get someone to cut and bring wood so I can infuse it. He also needs to cut and organize the wood in the house. And to take the dry wood out of the drying room. We can figure all of that out. I think a single person can do all that and still hunt or do other odd jobs around the city. Would you agree to a 50% stake in the enterprise? 75%, 60%, 75, and I only take 25, the rest counting as contributions. Agree. And he shakes my hand. I would have agreed to 100% if you had left the money for us to use. I shrug my shoulders. I don't care about the money. As long as it is being used, I'm happy. If you don't care about the money, give it all to us. He says for the sake of argument, just so he can gauge Nash's reaction. If I don't care, other people might mistake for it being unimportant and we are not in a society ready to live without money. I care a little. I realize its importance and how it affects people. It's an illusion we believe in so much. It almost becomes real. When you break this illusion, things become different. One day we might learn to live without money, but with the multiverse and the system, I just shrug and enter the smithy. I head to where the sword is hanging and I hear a squeal behind me. Looking over the spokesperson for the guild, I see he has been lifted in the air without apparent cause. I wonder if there might be some security system, but ignore it for now. I go to his side and gently push him outdoors. When he is outside, whatever force lifted him is released and he sprawls in the ground. Maybe there is a security system in the shop. Are you hurt? 
No, he responds, getting up and hitting his clothes to get rid of the dust. Is that the sword? Well, I should be going. There is too much to do. He gets the money and counts to make sure it's too silver. I give him the sword and say, Wait a few minutes, Mr. Blackwood is almost here, and you might want to be in the conversation with our new client. That is a good point. I take my tools and dagger and present them to him, saying, Here, take these. I don't use them during the day. You can consider them a loan to the guild. He chuckles and answers. I hadn't thought of that. We could also add a small stipend to the eventual payoff. I mean, there are people loaning each other tools, but nothing more centralized. I head inside to light the forge, and I stack the wood in the forge in record time. I light it and put men on the magical blower. The entire time, I nod and grunt at the right places as Charlie speaks. He goes on in how the loans might work, but soon he stops and starts to think silently. I go back to the door and we wait for the smith. In only a few minutes he gets walking at a leisurely pace and we greet him. With a grim he says, So it was you I felt trying to sneak in and steal everything? And you, my very own disciple, were helping him. I take out the two silver and give him. He pockets them without counting. I see you have some scuff marks. I hope the security system didn't hurt you. No, thank you. I forgot all the shops had this field up. I look at him, but Mr. Blackwood says, So people have already begun trying to sneak in. On the very first night, I interrupt and ask, Am I on the authorized list or something? I got your mana and the two helpers that were here later than usual to mark you as authorized entries. I'm still notified, but it doesn't block your entry. Smith, wanting to get on with things, waits a second or two and begins his pitch. Well, regardless of all that, we have a business proposal and opportunity for you. Hewam, an opportunity, sounds interesting, go on. The council has been made aware that you require big amounts of magically enhanced wood. We, in conjunction with Mr. Nash, have sought to remedy the situation by providing wood for you at a reduced price. For now, our production sits at around the equivalent to 50 or 60 log equivalents to your own and we would be open to selling them at 80% price. I'm listening, he says, interested. I feel, however, his interest has less to do with profit and more with our progression. If we can depend less on the village's economy and other factors outside our control, we will be in a better position. It seems he is genuinely interested in helping us. The other workers get to the forge and look over everything to make sure I set everything and look to see if there is still something to be done. We would bring the wood here at around this time. We are still drying the wood, so it might take a day or two to get the first load. He thinks for a moment and asks me, How did you figure out a way to dry wood so fast? Or did you use a different infusion method? You don't have the magical skills to do that yet. It will take you months to figure it out. I am not drawing the water out with magic. I'm putting the wood in a really hot environment to dry it fast. Wood done like that is not quite as good as naturally dried wood. But it's all going to burn anyway. It will not make a big difference. He shrugs at his last statement and shakes both our hands. Now we can get the economic engine started in Snowball. Terra Mystica, now those were the good times. Charlie buys a couple of other weapons along with a tool or two. I put this all out of my mind and focus on the work with a giddy feeling. We are starting to get things on track. Chapter 15 Deep in meditation, I can almost feel something in the distance. It didn't take too long for the tug to start. I had too little mana when I started this exercise. It seems impossible to even get close to what I found last time I was here. Seen as it is still so far away, I leave my meditation and see I only have six points of mana. I get up and continue helping on the smithy. The smith is holding a smaller metalwork than last time. I see him handling the head of a spear with plus three of potential attack. The system for some reason only shows this potential attack while it isn't mounted on a shaft. Soon after, I see the last of the weapons being bought. By now, if my math is correct, there are 60 weapons in circulation. I think and I should see if I can get one or two of the magical users to provide the mana the forge needs. There are a couple of options this could open up. I consider the experience from the two other apprentices demonstrating they are interested in learning. We can probably make another 20 basic weapons per night. They will not be quite as good as the mass-produced goods from Blackwood. At least at first. The experience, however, would be invaluable. And we could get a few more weapons in the hands of everyone. If everyone also helped, we may be able to do about 40 a night. The day goes on and as soon as a weapon or tool is manufactured somebody takes it. I ask Mr. Blackwood what we could do to increase the speed of weapon production. He answers simply. It's not a matter of how much help, but the quality of help. I take that to mean, 
Our skill level and experience increase is the most important thing to focus on. As we progress, we will observe him increase the quality and speed of item manufacture. As the day ends, I quickly leave. Jack and Li Wei stay to forge tonight as well. I charge the wind blower to the maximum and leave the smithy with 12 less mana sitting in my pool. They can work for an hour with this. By the end of the hour, they will probably already be using the grinding stones. I stop by the end to eat. This time for the first time, there is a different dish to order. Salted snake soup. I laugh, but order one anyway. After that, I head over to the drying room. I check everything is on track and head to the guild. Is there anyone that can help me with magic? I read all you guys have, but I can unlock the skill. I have the money. I can pay a dozen copper for someone to spend a day teaching me. As I said, I'm sorry, few people have unlocked the skill. We only have four people working for the guild with magical expertise. If we had the manpower, we would help you, but we simply don't. You can focus on other things if you don't have the attributes to more easily unlock the skill. When we have more people, they will be teaching classes. You can join those. My intelligence is just fine. I need this. No, I demand this now. You guys take over control of the city. Someone comes for help and you just shrug. I understand your frustration, but there is nothing I can do. We are stretched thin enough as it is. I look over the interior of the guild hall and I see as they have slowly, but surely, started to fix up the place. There is nothing fancy. They wouldn't want to pass the impression they were frivolous. But I can see most of the old and almost broken furniture has been replaced. It is impressive while still feeling functional. The man huffs and doesn't say anything more. I step up and, wary of the trouble my words may cause, start speaking. I need to get in contact with one of the magic users. The man grins a little, looking over the interaction. Does he hope to see me getting rejected? Regarding what? Says the scribe, with a scowl in his face wondering the problem this might cause. The smithy. Okay. Looking to the side in the direction of another guild employee, he says, Carlos, take Mr. Nash to see one of the people at the training hall. Introduce him to one of the magic users. Okay. At that, I start to leave but the man grabs my arm. I move to avoid but he is quick and probably has skill levels in unarmed combat. He tries to pull me, but with my strength, I overpower him and leave his grasp. So you are a hotshot. You had that damn useless book and now you get whatever you want. Is that it? I leave following the young teenager the scribe addressed. Paying attention to what he had been doing, I guess at his occupation and the guild. I see papers being organized and neatly stacked. Perhaps he is a messenger or an assistant. This time the man does not try to stop me. I hear the scribe as I leave the building. No, sir. He is not getting special treatment. But he has made more than a silver coin and contribution to the guild. But don't think it is all about the money. He is the most advanced magic user we have by far. His contributions to our underest. In only a few paces, I can no longer hear him. I continue following the young boy. The younger people around seem all to be relegated to being messengers or helping older people. If they are not properly used, their talents might be wasted. The young mind is much more flexible compared to mature people. I assume they only work some of the time, so it should not be a problem. If they pay attention and their suggestions don't go ignored, it might be a good position to learn and help our development. That all anyone can hope for. Getting to the training hall, I see people sparring with wood weapons. It seems they have improved their carpentry skills. All of the weapons are at least decently made. They seem to be fairly green wood, but we can't hope for much better just yet. The skill level seems to be quite high compared to people who only spend a few days learning. That, however, is not too surprising. We are in a world that seems to increase our learning speed quite a bit. Our stats are rapidly increasing, and we have a uniquely suited environment for everyone to give it their all. I go behind the marked training field to a building. There, I'm introduced to Merlin. I don't find out his actual name, just the nickname he adopted. What you have provided us has been of immense help. We would have taken twice as long to figure things out without your insight. No worries. I came because I need someone to help fuel the forge blower. It needs mana to work. I'm still working things out, but when I'm done we can expect at least 20 more items per night. For now, it will be only plus one items, but that is good enough. I didn't know we had an equipment shortage. I thought we just needed enough coins. That is a big problem. It really isn't just about the money. Time is a precious resource. We can't wait months for the blacksmith to forge enough gear for everyone. We also need armor, tools, and even stuff like nails. If we add it all up you can just wonder at how long it would take for everyone to be equipped. Yeah, how skilled does this person need to be? 
They need to provide 12 mana for each hour of operation. They only need to be proficient enough to expel mana from their finger. The device takes care of the rest. We can deal with that. There are a dozen people that might be willing to do the work for a few coppers. It's not as if they are wasting the mana. Just observing a machine like that, they might learn something. I agree. It has helped me to improve my mana manipulation. I also like to discuss the process to infuse wood with you. It is going to be a very important part of our economy very soon. The sooner we have a few people doing that, the sooner we can get more and better gear. What is the limitation now? I have too little mana, given the efficiency I'm working with. I spend four to five mana at the start of the process. By the end, I'm sitting at one mana on the infused wood. Almost all of it is wasted on transforming the mana in a fire type of mana. The blacksmith uses about 200 logs a day. That is a two silver revenue stream. If we could not only supply him with wood but also use the wood at night for forging, we would greatly reduce the coin we need to spend. Let's sit down so we can go over the process. I have a better idea. We sat beside the fire a few feet from the pit I built. He fusses a bit at sitting on the ground, but seeing as there are no chairs anywhere nearby, without further complaint he plops down. I was thinking this afternoon, and I got the idea to use other people's mana to make more wood. I'm not sure it will work, but I don't see why it wouldn't. We would be using a more basic process, so it won't be quite as efficient. For now, however, it is good enough. Okay, what to do first? I assume you brought me here to test this supposedly basic method. Yes. Now start by sending mana out of your fingers and placing it in this lock. Yes, that is just right. Now hold the mana in position. Send about 20 units of mana. Now, try to will the mana to stay in place. After a minute he succeeds and I throw the log in the fire. At his protestation I say, Don't worry, that is part of the process. Just wait a minute now. I start to draw the mana as it leaves the log and analyze it. It has a different quality to it, just like every single mana type I saw before. After some examination, I notice the similarities to the mana types I drew from fires before. Can you see the mana I'm drawing? I can see the mana near your hand. No problem, you only need to be able to put mana in the log. I take this mana and put it on this green log here and voila. From here, we only need to dry it. I say presenting the log. The process you used is, like I said, a more basic one. It needs an input of 20 mana for each log. But with a bit practice, anyone with mana manipulation should be able to do it. I agree. We talked for an hour and I ran through the experimentation process I had to get to this point. He gives me a few ideas and we part ways with the outline of a plan. Seeing as the biggest hurdle is the amount of mana, he will provide lessons for anyone willing to give a tithe of mana. With that, we can kickstart production. I suggest we pay a portion of the proceeds after they pay for their education. For now, everyone is cooperating very well and there haven't been any wide-scale problems, but we can't count on that if we abuse people's generosity. He also says he will attempt to come up with an easier process for the mana infusion. I suggest it may be better to seek a better method to improve mana conversion from neutral mana to fire mana. He says that he will pursue both, and much more. I also discovered that most people in town seem to have adopted a similar method to magic as mine. They use runes or chants to give general direction to the magic and give specifics with their willpower. I wonder if there is some criterion for our placement in this village together. Perhaps this is a human quirk? I wonder if my book has any new information. It has been a while since I have looked at my book. I take it out and go to the end. There I find a new rune and nothing else significant. I wonder if the book is saving up for something I really want to know. Can my strength, as the book measures it, be saved up? Focusing on the rune, I see it is another connecting rune. I still don't have a very good idea as to how they are used. All I know, for now, is that they are extremely important in creating bigger and more complex magic. I continue to convert and infuse mana until I run out. Putting all the freshly infused wood in the room, I check how close we are getting to fully dry wood. I see that only the closest pieces will be even close to done by morning. Arranging everything, I find someone checking out the fire as I'm about to leave. Hey, are you the person the guild has sent to take care of the fire? Who? Yes. I'm Dimitri. I'm Nash. I know. Everyone knows. You made quite a splash that first day. Yeah. So how are we doing things? The guild pays me by the hour, so I can do everything if you want. Just tell me how you would like things organized and your schedule. That way I can get things done by the time you need them. At the start, we only have me infusing wood. So all the wood you bring will be pilling up. But after there are a few more people, we will have to set up a schedule. Okay. What exactly do you need? 
I need green wood so I can infuse and dry wood to burn. The wood we burn can be old trunks or anything that burns well. We will have three piles to start, the green wood, the dry wood, and the infused wood taken out of the hot room. After that, we discuss for a good hour and I leave. I get my staff in my room and head outside. It's time for a little run. I keep a fast pace seeing as I only have another three or four hours before I will be going to sleep. I only run into one pack of wolves. Fighting them is easy like always. I try to make my track through new places as much as I can so I can get a good mental picture of everything around the village. Returning, I swim in the river to get the sweat out. Before leaving I see one fish and I wonder why isn't anyone fishing. I try approaching the fish, but he swims away too fast to see. I feel a small shiver hit my back. To be that fast he might be a high-level mob. I wonder what possible trouble was doing so near what is supposed to be the starting zone. After the encounter, I returned straight to the village. I ran a total of 60 miles. I feel my muscles getting loose and a bit tired. I ended up happy with my nighty training. I wind down by meditating and go to sleep like a log in my favorite place. It's such a wonderful place. There is soft earth, just a few feet from a tree and nobody bothers me. What more could I ask of life? Chapter 16 The next day I stand along with everybody else waiting for Charlie to start. As always, he easily grabs everyone's attention. He doesn't mince words or talk for hours what could be conveyed in a short meeting. He gets to the point and everybody not only hears, but they also listen. It is an impressive skill. At the thought I wonder if this is a skill granted by the system. Even in the first day he was good, but in these last couple of days, I did notice a difference. Good morning everyone. Today we have a few very important announcements. They may change our perspective on the situation we are in. I would ask that everyone to pass the information to anyone that was not here today. If you can't do that, send them to the guild. To start, after extensive testing from our people in the herbalist department, we have managed to create a salve. We have taken to calling it a healing salve. The effects are to increase by 20% HP regeneration. It also has the effect of increasing the speed with which you are healed. We have started to work on a mana powder to increase mana regeneration, but haven't had any luck so far. As a few of you know, the HP number and actual injury received are not an exact match. For extensive injuries like sunburns, it is a fairly accurate method to measure it. The same goes for scratches, as long as they are spread out over the body. Bigger broken bones, such as an arm or leg, also follow the same rule. If you are measuring smaller, but relatively serious injuries, such as a broken finger, the numbers start to become significantly different. In this state, however, they are not totally incompatible. On the other extreme, if you are injured by a dagger and immediately cauterize the wound, the healing time will be similar to if you had left the blood flow. That said, the loss of blood counts as an additional injury. Nobody should stop trying to staunch the bleeding. If someone wants a more detailed analysis, just visit the guild. So far, we have a few training courses and many who come to the guild do learn what they came seeking. But a more personal touch or an actual teacher can be a boon in one's learning. With that in mind, we will begin a new initiative in the guild. We will be starting classes to help speed up everyone's training and education. Some of them will be paid or require work and compensation. We also bought a new book. We will be buying a license so we can share it with everyone when we have the required tin silver. We are not aware of the specific information, but the person who bought has told us it is definitely worth the money. And last, what probably will most affect us here. New arrivals are being found in the woods. Hearing those words, a murmur goes through the crowd. So far three children, all 12 years old, have been brought to the village. We think that is happening everywhere. As children hit the age of 12, they are brought to the starting zone. We do not know where these children were. One of them has told us that they were not on earth and have spent weeks someplace else. They do not have any information on the system and seem to have had their memories altered so they cannot provide any more information of where they were. I have nothing else. Thank you for your attention and I will see you all tomorrow. After these significant revelations I had to work. I spend the first few hours reflecting on the implications. The mana powder could really be a boom. It would greatly increase our learning of magic. Work on the forge goes smoothly. As the day goes by, Mr. Blackwood trusts me with more and more work. By the end of the day, we work side by side. Metal is slowly forming in my hands. I weld and start shaping the metal and he finishes up the pieces. Jack and Li Wei also start to actually work on metal, instead of just helping. They do the rougher grind of the metal on the stones. 
Mr. Blackwood is a practiced hand and seems to know exactly how much responsibility he can give each person. He gives enough to push everyone's skills up. At the same time, he doesn't overwhelm anyone. Every single item has the same plus two stats, even as our portion of the work increases. I try to make sense of it. I know my welds and some of my shaping is not up to par. At least part of the work we do should be of inferior quality. But try as I might, I cannot see a single defect on the final product. I even try to analyze them with ether, but nothing gives me the smallest of clues. At the end of the day, we have made 28 items. If we start the day tomorrow at the same speed we finished today, we will be making around 35 items in a single day. At this pace, we could make a thousand items in less than a month. Things are looking up. During the day, I hear a certain someone whining. The entire day, I hear how things are unfair. I do my best to put him out of my mind. Blackwood's mood seems to improve given our increased production pace. Given my estimate of his skill and experience level, he is probably bored out of his mind to be making such basic items at such low speeds. I hope our efforts to equip everyone continue to bear fruit. If we end up stuck in this as the maximum speed, it would not be enough. Perhaps we will even need to open our own forge. All of that, however, is in the future. For now, we need to learn. Tomorrow's problems we will solve tomorrow. Let's not put the cart before the horse. After some reflection, I compare our speed to a medieval work pace. We are working at industrial speed. Logically thinking, with the tools here, a smith with a few helpers should be able to make a sword in hours. Making several items per hour should be impossible without industrialization. That will make for interesting interactions in the future. Imagine a level 500 smith mass producing stuff versus 100 people in a factory. The lone smithy would likely win in quality, time not being a constraint. If you measure speed, however, things may get dicey. When everybody gets their pay, I see Brad by a spear. Don't expect me tomorrow. I'm quitting. This has been nothing but a waste of my time. I work hard every day, and you expect me to pay you, so you can teach me. Absolutely not. I'm already receiving such lousy pay. He huffs and storms off. I shake my head. He really doesn't get it. He could have gotten a half-decent spear for five or six coppers. If only he had put in the work. I may not understand it all, but for days I have seen the smith fighting the system's restrictions. Any other small conflict may be from his culture. He may look human, but he was alien. We are not dealing with NPCs. These are living creatures just like humans. They are not our servants. It is to our benefit some of them also dislike the council and possibly the system. As the blacksmith leaves, everybody stays. They are probably hoping Mr. Blackwood will let them hold the hammer instead of standing by the side holding the items in place or putting more firewood in the forge. I buy two ingots and make a spear and a few arrow tips. I ended up staying a little later than usual. I saw the three people who haven't forged anything yet. They were struggling to do the work themselves. They probably didn't step foot in a smithy in their whole lives before the system. Everybody was still finishing their work when I left them to their devices. I stop quickly to drop off the spear and arrow tips in the guild hall. In the drying room, I take a couple of wood pieces that seem to be dry enough. I burn one of them and am happy to see the result. Not quite as good as what the smith uses already, but good enough. Seeing Dimitri pilling wood outside, I go to talk to him. So, is everything going well? Yes, I kept a good pace and cut enough wood in half a day. I could probably do three days supply in a day of work, if I push the rhythm. I see you found quite a bit of dry wood. Yeah, trying to dry them in the hot room would be too wasteful. I had to spend some time looking, but I found a good supply 15 minutes away. Up the river? Yeah. Okay. Keep up the good work. Could you help me with something? Sure, if I can. Just, I mean. I'm trying to unlock the skill mana manipulation. You want help unlocking it? Kind of. I read all there was on the guild about it, but I still can't unlock it. Try to get meditation first. Why? I mean, I know I will also need it, but shouldn't I focus on the basics first? You may be right. But consider whenever mana manipulation is more basic than meditation. We keep talking for another few minutes. I quickly infuse the load of wood for tonight and I sit to meditate. As I start, I talk, trying to guide him into a more relaxed state. Each phrase of mine is further and further apart. I stop talking an hour later and concentrate on going as deep as I can. Hours go by. The moon comes and goes. The sun starts to peak and I end my meditation. I have rarely spent so long meditating. I usually stop after six hours in my longest sessions. This must have been nine hours. I know most people would probably have called it a waste to spend so long meditating. 
I, however, know that just the extra mana Regan would be reward enough. Considering the other benefits, there is no contest. I really need a long pause to decompress. I may have taken deep short rest stops, but I was really wound up. I have been pushing myself as hard as I dare since the day I came here. Now I can feel again. The air is fresh. The sky is blue. The trees are new. Not a single tree I took notice of was the same species as what I had seen on Earth. They may remind me of Earth, but that's not where I'm. Every aspect of the world constantly reminds me of it. Relaxed after tonight, I pulled my status screen, and I'm happy with the messages I see. You have increased your blacksmithing skill by plus 5, blacksmithing level 14. You have increased your running skill by plus 1, running LV. 30. You have increased your staff mastery skill by plus 1, staff mastery level 4. You have increased your mana infusion skill by plus 3, mana infusion level 3. You have increased your carrying skill by plus 1, carrying level 15. You have increased your unarmed combat skill by plus 2, unarmed combat level 4. You have increased your mana manipulation skill by plus 7, mana manipulation level 15. You have increased your kinetic meditation skill by plus 7, kinetic meditation level 28. You have increased your strength by plus 1. You have increased your dexterity by plus one. You have increased your perception by plus one. You have increased your intelligence by plus one. You have gained 2256 EXP from various sources. Expand. My skills are really growing. I would have thought my pace might slow down significantly as I tried to reach higher levels. So far that hasn't happened. I look over, expand, and a breakdown of the source from the experience shows up. After a quick check, I close the tab and head for the drying room. On my way, I feel the growth in my left eye. Sending my ether into it, I track the changes. Since the last time I took a look, the small growth has become bigger. By now he has more fully enveloped my eye. A few of the thinnest strands have thickened quite a bit. I wonder if this seed will try to obscure my vision in the future. For now it seems content to grow where it is. The problem is that I know very well from who this tiny seed came from. Sensing this tiny creature's ether, I believe it is not a new growth. The ether signature is exactly the same as Pando's. It is also behaving like the trees I planted before. Though, it does seem to be more conscious than the usual sapling. Wait a little while. You might be reunited with your grove yet. I wonder at the absurdity of the whole thing. There goes the tree man. He has tree branches coming out of all his orifices. Branches and leaves cover his eyes, ears, nose, and even mouth. He is an expert in scaring children and criminals away. I pile as many logs as I can carry under my arm and head to the smithy. In my second trip, Dimitri shows up and helps me. We are finished in only a couple of trips. Getting into a rhythm I'm growing used to, I organize the smithy and put firewood on the forge. Seeing as this time I am working only with infused wood, I light the forge, but only put a few minutes of mana. Only enough to make sure it does not go out. If I fire it up at full intensity, it will just waste too much wood. I leave for the daily meeting hoping to find out what they will be talking about. Is it such important information they had to announce the day before? Today there are a few more people in the meeting. I would guess 950 instead of the usual 800. After his usual greetings, I'm deeply disappointed. I apologize, but we didn't manage to get enough coins to buy the license. We should have enough in a couple of hours. For people who don't want to wait until tomorrow, you can pass by the guild in the afternoon and we will have compiled the information. Damn. I really wanted to know. Perhaps the coppers I get from the wood sale will help. Chapter 17 Finally comes the hour. I know the city has other projects, and right now they might even be more significant than this. A few copper coins may not be a priority. But if we take into consideration the costs, the results are clear. We could be saving of two silver coins, with two people's work and mana. We would also not be dependent on the firewood stores from Mr. Blackwood. I count 50 copper coins after talking to the smith. The guild representative and I settle on a 12 to 38 split. He takes 26 of my coins as a contribution to the guild. I'm glad my pocket is a little heavier. I really have not let go of my own love of shiny things. My precious. Hi he he I. The forge is hot in no time, and we start working. Knowing the people here I know the pace today is not frantic, but someone, looking from the outside, might describe it as such. Mr. Blackwood taught us much yesterday. Our coordination is unparalleled. I have rarely watched group sports, but I know you don't turn your head away from the ball and just trust your teammate to make a perfect pass. With everyone fresh and rested, the pace is even faster than when we closed last night. As the day goes, we settle on a more manageable pace. With a mental count, 
I find we managed to make 36 items today. And that is not all we will be making today. When Mr. Blackwood is about to leave, I use my share of the money from the sale of the wood. Everyone else pitches in, and we manage to buy 10 ingots of metal. Even the new guy that got here today pitches in. During the day, we discover he was a welder. And on occasion, he forged items with a propane torch. Mr. Blackwood almost had a fit when he heard this. You do not call what he did forging. You can't do that, not even in a joke. For firewood, we use a couple extra wood logs we brought. While we work alone, we talk. After some back and forth, we set on a plan. We decide what should be done with the items and how. About an hour in, when we were finishing the part we need the forge for, I noticed the temperature. The forge is not hot enough, or at least not as hot as it should. I will need to take a look and check to see what the problem is later. There could be so many reasons. The wood may only be dry instead of seasoned. The type of wood could different. My infusion process may not be as good. The transformation may introduce impurities on the mana. I try to figure out the most probable cause, but I'm not successful. Everyone works hard to make the best possible weapons. I help a little as I can, but most of the time I let them figure out on their own. They have enough theoretical knowledge. What they need is to learn how to put things into practice. I don't need factory drones standing beside me. I need thinking and breathing human beings. Beings that see a problem and solve it on their own. We all close the forge together and head to the guild. Getting there I address the scribe. Hi, I would like to make a contribution to the guild, along with my fellow friends. Okay, just tell me your name and give me the money or items. That is the thing, ours is a different case. We are looking to get paid for the materials we spend and leave the rest as a contribution. Those are the blacksmith apprentices? Technically no, they are not. He said he would need 100 years to teach anyone if he were to take in an apprentice. That said, close enough. It doesn't sound too complicated. So, if I understand you correctly, I propose to you this. We are willing to pay 50% for the items, compared to what the smith charges. You get the price of the metal and wooden coin. The rest of the balance is awarded as a contribution to the guild. Sounds fair. I wonder for a moment how much he is aware of goes on. He has access to all the books for the finances and all kinds of information. People also come to him first, when they need to know something or to inform the guild. He seems to have wide latitude. He offers a fairly generous contract given our items have only half of the stats. The terms don't surprise too much though. If everything goes according to plan, they will effectively be paying pennies on the dollar on these loans. They will only repay them after there is much more money circulating. Yes, it sounds fair. I and everyone else take the items and put it all on a side table. Rose, take all these items, appraise then, and come back with it all written down. Don't mind the stats. Consider them all plus two attack, and I will make the necessary adjustments. Yes, sir. I go with Rose to another table, and she starts writing down the values. I look at her, and she seems to be 12 years old. Could she be a new arrival? So what do you do here, Rose? Everything. I pass messages, appraise items, talk with people, send where they need to go. When there are too many people coming in at once, I go talking to people in line to see if I can hurry things along. How long do you work? About six hours a day. I spend the day hunting rabbits with my friends. Well, at least she isn't going out to hunt at night. Someone so young will not have properly developed a healthy appreciation of what to fear. This lack of fear is a very valuable tool, but if misused, it can also get you killed. Everything went smoothly. The total came out to 1 silver 70 copper. We get 60 copper and decide on the split. In total, we now have 1 silver 10 copper more in contribution to the guild. I get 30 copper, given I brought the wood. I give the scribe 2 copper coins. This is because we used some of the wood it would be sold to the blacksmith tomorrow. The guild has helped in the manufacture, so I thought it would be a fair split. For now this is fine. When you ramp up production, then we will talk about it. Everyone in the guild thanks all profusely. Along with our own work we made 43 items today. That is a good pacing to keep for this early in the game. Saying my goodbyes to everyone, I head to my room. As I get close I notice massive piles of wood. With each step closer more come into view, and then, I see it all. Two big warehouses are being built. Three houses even had to be demolished to make space for the warehouses. There are giant piles of drywood. I also see a smaller pile of drywood. Numb I get closer. Sending some of my mana a probe, I sense it has mana inside. It is not the final product. I will have to burn it and actually infuse it later. But it is a big help, and it means mages have begun to work. 
With this, we will be able to greatly increase our rhythm with little concern for the cost of firewood. Shock slowly leaves me and realization settles in. I look at the whole place for a moment. Like my life depends on it, I run to the gate. People see me running faster than any of them could match. At the gate, I see a pair of men carrying a big tree. It is all its breeches cut out. I notice the coloration at the bottom. It must have been cut in the last ten minutes. Given the size, I wonder at their attributes for a second. It must weigh around 500 pounds. They walk at an almost normal pace. They don't even seem to be straining. I ignore all that. The gate closes behind them, but I don't let it slow me for a moment. I give my all and jump with all my strength. I manage to grab the top of the four meters high wall and in a single movement, I'm flying over it. I stare at the devastation. I freeze and all seem to rush by me. I tuck myself and landing rolling. I hurt my back a little because I wasn't paying enough attention, but it is only in the back of my mind. I see the end of the world before my eyes. Now I understand a fraction of how Oppenheimer felt. I truly have brought death to the world. I almost regret having started this whole thing. I let sorrow wash over me and don't spare any of the pain. I have, in the past, cut down trees. I tend to look for trees that needed to be cut down, but you can't always find them. Other times a healthy tree gets in your way. And it's okay. Be it construction, firewood, or whatever other reason it is a part of life I have grown used to. Ever since I got here I have buried deep the hurt from so much harm I have caused. We needed these resources. Seeing the logical progression of the path I set out on staring me in the face wrenches my heart. I look over the destruction, the devastation, and cry. My whole face is a mess. I ignore the few people staring at me, and I let myself go. I watch as the world I know crumbles and falls by each swing of the axe. I stand there for over an hour. The world passes me by, and I don't take notice of it. So what is happening? I mean last time we talked, I didn't know all this would be happening. At least not that it would be this fast. We neither. But we, in the guild council, were talking. At my scrunched up face, he continues. Yeah, some people have complained of us calling ourselves the council. The problem is that it is exactly what we are. That aside, we were talking, and we have come to the conclusion that investing work and money now into increasing the infused wood production would be ideal. We can easily make more than we can use. There are several options this would open up, but that is for later. With the expected returns, the investment is minimal. We only need people and mana. If everything goes smoothly, most people in the village will have access to mana in days or weeks. The classes have been going well? Oh, yeah, but wasn't only that. The class that Merlin taught had 12 people and 5 of them unlocked right then and there. The people that unlocked were the ones who spend the most time trying to unlock it. We think they just needed that last push. We also saw two dozen people unlock their magic skills after getting meditation today. Maybe Dimitri got the skill and he told other people. So you guys are looking at using this wood to supply all the needs from Mr. Blackwood as soon as possible? Yes, and to increase production. We should be running the forge around the clock. If we reach an agreement with the smith, we could have one or two of your guys there all night. With that and a few people to help, we would be able to increase production a lot. Maybe to double it. What are you making during the day? Today we made 36 items. Plus the 7 we made after hours. We could probably get 70 items a day. In a week, we might even be able to double the nightly production again. Making 100 items per day sounds really good. Does that sound possible? Yes, as long as the people that come actually learn while they work. If we also risk a few ingots of metal, we could train then even faster by letting them try to forge quickly. Doing that, we risk letting the metal lose its properties, but there is no substitute for practice when it comes to learning. We can't smelt metal. That means anything that someone mucks with is wasted metal until we can get a smelter running. We are pushing everything we are doing as fast as we dare. We are not apprising you of every detail, but what you have told us about the council seems to be spot on, and we are seeing their effects on everyone around town. The guards that rotate around on the gates are increasing their warnings without saying anything specific. What do you think it is? We are not sure. Our best guess is that there is a danger by us pushing so hard our incursions, especially at night. How we are trying to figure out how much danger we are in. We both think for a minute, and he tactfully asks. I don't mean to pry on what is not my business, but is something wrong? You have been crying. If you don't want to tell me it is absolutely fine, but I might be able to help. Don't worry about it. When I saw the destruction I helped create, I was not ready for it. Destruction? He pauses with a wondering tone, but after a moment he continues. Ooh, you mean the construction and our deforesting. 
I had heard of the crazy old coot sleeping under a tree, but I didn't know you were an eco-friendly person. It is not exactly accurate to call me eco-friendly. I have probably put down more threes than half the village combined, but I have mostly done that to promote the growth of my grove and of other forests. How is that not being an eco-friendly person? I don't like most labels. They tend to do far more harm than good. But letting this aside, when you see what you call eco-friendly people, what you get are mostly people either used as political tools or tied in some brand loyalty thing or a perversion of the intent behind the environmentally minded person. For such a happy and upbeat guy, you do have dark views of the world. I try to see the world for what it is, not what I wish it to be. Also, my partial isolation on earth may not have been the best for my mental state, but it gave me the perspective to see things other people didn't. You can't smell the house burning down around you when you live beside a coal plant. You are so used to the smell your brain ignores it. Well, I got to go. It was nice to have this conversation with you and we should finish as soon as possible. Can we count on you to work hard and make sure everything goes smoothly? Yes. I have worked most of my life for someone else. Now humanity needs me to contribute a little. I will rise to the challenge. He chuckles and goes, leaving me to my thoughts. I will do my utmost and when we are back on earth, Pando will be a rallying point for humanity. I wonder at the bonuses he would be getting. Perhaps he will also get the ancient title or something similar. Does he even have a system similar to mine? I settle in and start to infuse wood. I spend most of my mana and everyone else's. My mana handling skill is decent, so I manage to make about 180 logs in less than an hour. I am no longer limited by my own mana. At least when it comes to infusing wood. I let my mind wander and the work goes by in a flash. I pay attention in an abstract way to all the mana I sense as infuse the wood and I wonder if there is something I will be unlocking soon. Afterward, I think of other methods regarding the whole process and think of a further few experiments to run. Chapter 18 The day starts and I can see a few changes in the mood around town. I may have been able to easily brush aside the system's calming effect on newcomers, but few people, even now, had my willpower. I saw the signs over the week, but now it was obvious the mechanism was totally gone. I hear a couple arguments and even one fight break out an hour preceding the morning meeting. I get to the meeting cursing my memory. I should have asked Charlie yesterday when we were talking. I need to know what was so important in the book. There are even more people than yesterday in the courtyard. Mayor Douchebag provides only information we already have or useless stuff. I curse him silently. I should probably stop coming to the first part altogether. If it is anything important people will tell me. I wait to finally know the big secret. What could it be? I stop my wandering thoughts and listen as Charlie starts. Good morning everyone. I'm happy to say we bought the license and it was worth it. A few people have been told of the information, but we will provide an accurate and updated account of the information today. The book that we bought was named Introduction to the System Basics. From the name, we were not sure but after our scribe read it, we knew it was very important information. The main point is about our length of stay in the starting zone. I will talk about what is most relevant. Any specifics you can look over at the guild hall. Everyone will stay here for a month without any requirements. After that, for each month we want to spend here, we will need to pay. It is an individual requirement. In the first month, the requirement is a very affordable one silver. That means everyone should be able to stay for at least two months. After that, we are not aware of how much money we would need yet. There are a few hints the costs are exponential. The time we stay here will be beneficial for each of us. We don't have concrete numbers, but the starting zone has various bonuses. These bonuses affect our leveling speed, skill leveling, and even insight into the application of our skills. For each month we stay here, we will be returned to Earth approximately a month later. But considering the bonuses we get on Earth are significantly smaller, it will be worth to remain here as long as possible. The other mechanic determined by the last person to leave. Everyone on Earth will benefit from the person who remains the longest in the starting zone. For each month Earth's grace period free of aliens is increased. No matter how much we try we would not be able to provide the capital for everyone to remain for a long period, though we will attempt to help as we can. We are in uncertain times and our information is still incomplete so the plans may change but we feel this is a good starting point. Enough about this, next we will be discussing the other topics for today. We are happy to announce we found 15 new arrivals. They are all 12 years old as the first ones indicated. We don't have new information about where they stayed or in what conditions. They all have been adapting very well just like their colleagues who arrived on the first day. We also found our own clocksmith in the village and after some study, we will be building a town clock. 
It will be above the guild and have four faces. The design will be a very simple one, and we will need to adjust it and rewind it every hour. We will not have a gong for the time being, but it should be of help to everyone around town. At night, it will also be illuminated. We aim to be visible for half a mile out. To finish, I will bring up something most people have seen around the village. We are greatly expanding our tree harvesting. We are building big warehouses to accelerate the drying and store all this wood. For now, they are not very good to build anything. Green wood is not as strong. It rots and grows mold relatively quickly. We will have a few tiers of wood depending on their uses. The faster the drying, the less use the wood has until it is only good enough for kindling. This effort needs help from everyone in the village. If anyone wants to come and work, we will provide two meals and 15 copper in contribution per day. Finishing up, I see the crowd slowly disperse. I go to talk with Charlie and in a minute the crowd is thin enough. The scribe was not exaggerating yesterday. The information is quite important. Our efforts seem to have been on track. Yes, and we weren't even speculating openly on all of the implications. You were talking about the second thing you mentioned, right? Yes, we are pretty sure what the best strategy is. Hold out as long as we can and concentrate wealth in the hands of a single person so they can stay as long as possible. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. And not only our wealth, but the wealth from every single other village in our instance. Just think of the conflict this might cause. Everyone will want to be this chosen one. They will have higher levels, better gear, and more experience when they came back to Earth. If it is someone power-hungry, we can only guess at our predicament. We should be very careful about spreading this information just yet. What are you going to do about the pay at the end of this month? Most will have enough money and we will pay back what the rest need to stay another month. We will need the bonus levels back on Earth. By the way, we will begin to send scouting parties tomorrow. They will travel 100 miles in a random direction, map the surroundings, and come back. Time frame. 24 to 30 hours. We have four scouts at level 10. They got the agility and endurance to make the round trip. Tomorrow, I will be talking about it. Good. We need to make contact as fast as possible and have an idea of their intentions and inclinations. Anything else? Yes. We should take the time to discuss a few things regarding the infused wood and lumber. Also, we will need saws to cut the wood. We were thinking band saws, the ones that need two men. With guides, we might even get usable planks. Okay. I will talk to the smith. Talk with you later. I head to the smithy and the wood sale goes smoothly. I receive and split 50 copper coins again. The day goes and around noon Mr. Blackwood asks. So are you ready to make the best bin saw possible? I look at him for a moment but then it dawns. You want me to put mana in to heat up the forge? Yes, I can make a passable saw with this temperature, but with a hot forge I could make teeth so sharp a single man could saw through anything. Are you sure? There will be people who complain if we don't make the special weapon today. At those words, he grins and says, I don't care what those people think and it is worth it. It is definitely worth it. Okay, I will do my best. That is all you know how to do. I don't think I have seen you catch your breath for more than five seconds since the day you got here. I'm used to work tirelessly. Though I have to admit, I am resting even less than before. I ask for Livia to fill the machine with mana. After I sit and send a slow and steady stream of mana, I enter the almost trance-like state of meditation in less than a minute. I do my best and concentrate on making the mana as smooth as possible while sending only one mana every 20 seconds. I concentrate and think only of how smooth I am making the stream. I sense something coming closer and closer and I go deeper into my meditation. As I get closer it seems for every 10 steps I take I only get one step closer. The closer I get the more this chase seems as if it will go on forever. I try and try, but an hour and a half in my meditation I hear the distinctive voice from the smith. That is enough. I look over, and I see every single other person starring at the instrument he made. I look over the saw, and it looks more like the stuff he produced to hang on the walls. Those teeth look sharp. I inspect the saw. Simple bandsaw. A simple bandsaw that was processed with care by a master blacksmith. It is passed through a hardening process. Attack. Plus four. As he sees me inspecting, he speaks. This is a very good blade. It should be a great help to your project. I saw massive piles of wood and I know how much manpower goes into cutting everything up. This saw need care. Otherwise, it will break. But its teeth will chew through anything. Yeah, I saw you hardened it. Correct. It makes the blade and teeth more prone to breaking, but it will take longer to lose the edge and will hold a better edge. Now, how much? With my special discount, three silver. I whistle. I look it over again and go to the back to get more wood. 
It really is a nice blade. Totally worth the extra coins. The work goes on until I hear a commotion outside. I think it is probably another fight or something, but the smith stops about 30 seconds later. He then does something truly strange. He puts his hammer down and goes to the door. He never does that in the middle of work. Ever since I got here, every single time he puts his hammer down, it is only to pick up another tool. Mr. Blackwood is staring at the distance. I cannot see or hear what has his interest. I stop my work as well, and before I am at the door, I hear someone outside. Monster attack. Everybody come help. Monster attack. I stop the instant I hear. Monster attack. What is it? How much danger are we in? When, how, and why all pass through my mind? I think of the best way to defend myself. I grab the last weapon we made. Luckily, it hadn't been sold yet. I grab all my coins and throw them on the table running outside. I carry both my staff and my axe into battle. It is cumbersome, but I need to have options. I see almost everyone also heading to the gates at a fast pace. The village is up in arms and whatever is attacking us is going to regret it. Most people still don't have proper weapons, but I see people with better clubs and staffs in hand. I even see a couple of wood spears with the tip hardened by fire. My pace is fast and I slowly pass people until I see the gate. I see someone from the guild organizing everyone. Everybody, gather up and don't go outside. The hunting team has returned early. They run into a monster too strong for them to kill. After trying to lose the monster, they discovered that it has very good tracking abilities. It seems it's some kind of. The world trembles and everybody freezes in their step. I feel a primal fear. The sound I hear vibrates everything, even my bones. This roar was not made by a small animal. A lion would not be able to do this. The sheer volume of air it moves is unbelievable. I search and find something being transmitted along with the sound. I notice very faint notes of mana. So you are using a skill that instills fear and paralyzes your prey. I take only a moment to overcome the effects and can move. A few people fall flat-footed and take a few seconds to get up, but nobody seems injured. I run and jump catching the edge of the wooden walls and peek over it. I see then a monstrosity. Not like the wolves, which look like normal wolves, just diseased. This enormous being is the size of an elephant. Its skin is dark and thin. I can see the bone under it protruding slightly. This enormous beast looks like an elephant or a mammoth. I inspect it, and the results don't surprise me. Inspection has partially succeeded. Name, Warped Mammoth. Level, Unknown. Information, Unknown. I keep looking at it, and I can almost feel the rage coming from it. This is not natural. This beast, no this monster does not behave like a normal mammoth as far as I can tell. It will attempt to kill all its wake. It also seems to have an uncanny ability to track unless the scouts didn't know what they were doing. They should be smart enough to go through places their size would not be impacted, but that hampered this enormous beast. I hear the person organizing everyone continues talking at the back. This beast does not seem to have a very high endurance, but it has very good tracking ability. Let's just see what it does from behind the walls and act from there. In my mind, I can already see the panic setting in place if these are the orders. I don't think it is the wrong approach. I doubt we had the time to properly debrief the scouts and we are not really trained in group battles. This is probably going to be a disaster. Almost everyone here is green as they come in group battles. Even people have seen were fought a different kind of war. Earth's modern warfare is quite different from what we will be encountering. I see two people standing on a platform. Both have big arms and are tall. The bows is taller they are. I see their faces as they draw the bows to their maximum length and let loose. They must be drawing at least 200 pounds. I barely see the arrows, so fast they leave the bow. A moment later, as I turn to the mammoth, I hear the impact. Looking at it, it doesn't seem to have been affected at all. The arrows hit his skin barely penetrated. Releasing my staff seems the best choice. It will be of little to no use. I hear the archers reporting. Minimum penetration. No visible effect. Continuing to shoot. They use minimal words and try to be as concise as possible. That is something everybody should learn. I see them drawing for a second shot. As they take aim, the massive beast heads for them. It runs in massive steps and comes at an incredible pace. It seems it may not have the best endurance, but it is fast. Halfway to the wall, the archers let loose a second volley. One of the arrows in a massive stroke of luck hits the left eye. I hear a roar from the mammoth and analyze the mana coming. The roar is even more terrifying than before. This close, even with less mana, the effect is stronger. The attack may not have cycled its cooldown, or the beast may not have waited until it was at full power. Maybe a lack of mana is a limiting factor. 
It seemed to have released a massive amount less than 30 seconds ago. I see the beast lower its head. One of the archers who was beginning to draw freezes and after a moment he jumps from the platform. I make a similar mental calculation than the archer. Three tons, traveling at 30 miles per hour, heading directly to a wooden wall. The logs driven into the ground may be horse-proof or even bull-proof, but they are definitely not mammoth-proof. I pull my body and run to the platform timing my speed to be just after he shots and before the mammoth hits. I see him shoot, and I barrel into him pushing him as far from the wall as I can. Luckily, he already had taken a step back, and we go flying at an angle away from the wall. A moment later, I hear a crash sound and feel a vibration through the air. The wall breaks and my back absorbs a massive impact. We are both propelled in the ground. I can feel I almost broke a few ribs but ended up with only a few scuffs. I look back and immediately see the wall. It is almost broken at the base and bend in by about two meters. I see I'm still very close to the wall and move a few meters back. I hook the axe as well as I can on my belt. Scrambling to catch one of the bows in the ground and a quiver of arrows I look back. All around panic sets in. People are running and screaming like headless chickens. This is proof we not ready for this. A moment later I hear the monster on the other side pushing the wall in and it slowly gives way. I run along the wall and climb balancing on the top a dozen meters away. I knock an arrow in the bow and draw it imitating the archers as well as I can. Even in my inexperience, I hit the side of the mammoth. When the wooden wall goes down a little more he stomps on it, making the process even faster. I get a little closer and he turns in my direction. The narrow corridor between the house and wall slows him down, but he manages to go through. I carefully aim, and when I'm only ten feet away, I let loose an arrow straight in his eyes. This got your attention earlier. I don't manage to hit head on and only perforate the eyelid this time. A moment later, I jump and run outside the walls. I get behind him, only four paces away before I shoot him in his most vulnerable place. I hear his roar. Being so close now, I freeze for long enough I stumble. I scramble back as he tries to walk back, but he doesn't have much luck. Take that, you dumb beast. After a moment, I see him push with his front paws and stand on his back legs. Oh, shit. I run back without letting loose another arrow and throw the bow in the direction of the second archer. I take the quiver from my shoulder and throw it as well. He runs behind me and in a few seconds, we both look back to see the mammoth going over the broken part of the wall. I hear him asking. What is the strategy? We kite him to death. I try to come with terms with the long and arduous affair before me. I might die today. I push all the irrelevant stuff out of my mind and solely focus on our goal. Chapter 19 I see five people coming out of the gate. I also see a few people preparing to leave through the gap in the gate. I watch the pace of the mammoth and I change my direction to force it to make turns. If he has a straight path, we will be disadvantaged. His maximum speed is impressive, but he probably can't turn very fast. I try to keep a distance of 10 meters between us at all times and in no time the archer steps to the side seeing me easily keeping a 20 miles per hour pace. The archer is probably conserving his strength and the mammoth doesn't even look his way. I several times make 120 degree turns. With his huge mass, the mammoth needs time to slow down and make the turn. I calculate my exertion and find I can probably keep this pace for an hour without running out of steam. At the side I see the archer talking with everybody else probably trying to convey my idea and plan how to best implement it. He also took notice of how effortlessly I'm maintaining this speed and realizes they have at least a few minutes to prepare. The guild commander gets here with another dozen people and I regard their gear. I see the plus three spear was fitted with a different shaft. This one is not lightweight. It looks like a very dense wood from the movement of the man carrying it. The color also seems to indicate some type of oak or maybe even stronger wood. We will be needing that to penetrate the skin of the mammoth. I'm also happy to see the wielder. With the same stats, a more muscled person will have more strength. Simple physics dictates that. Their punches will also carry not only more speed, but also more mass. I have seen him around town. Greg is a beast of a man. I would guess 6 feet 8 inches and 222 40 pounds of muscle. He towers over almost everyone in town. He doesn't look like a gym rat full of warped muscles and tailoring their training to simply getting big. I have seen him carrying big loads of stuff a couple of times around town. Looking at the ease he keeps pace and few other things I have seen from him, I guess his stats are fairly well distributed. I concentrate on the chase after a moment and leave them to figure it out a strategy. I keep zigzagging around the mammoth. Whenever I see a rock in the ground I run a bit ahead, grab it and throw it on the mammoth's head. Most of them hit him. 
After two minutes in, he roars causing me to stumble and roll on the ground. Without waiting for a single instant, I get to my feet with the momentum of my roll and keep running. I try to analyze the mana coming from him as he roars. I try to take a small sample. I fail, by my best guess, the will behind it is too strong to overcome. Seeing the others split into a few groups, I position myself to help them enter my movement patterns. I wait for them to catch up to hear the plan. Just keep trying to attract the aggro. We will have the archer shoot it from an angle. We are trying to hit the eye. Blinding him would be very good. Greg will lead the second team. They will try to spear him in the back. Okay, I will keep throwing rocks. As long as I keep aggro, things will be fine. His roar should not be much of a problem, but we will need to figure something out for when one of the archers or Greg gets aggro. Just keep it as long as possible. Breathless from talking while running so much we stop talking and concentrate. I chose bigger rocks and put my entire weight in throwing them. Bigger rocks are more likely to attract his attention. Whenever I can, I pick rocks weighing 5 to 10 pounds. Hitting the head of the mammoth gives him a very good reason to pursue me. I keep zigzagging for another minute when the first archer gets a square hit on his eyes. I have a baseball-sized rock in my hand, but I still throw it. Unlike previous times, I stop before I throw. I channel a baseball pitcher as well I can as the mammoth veers off towards the archer. This throw hits him squarely in the other eye, and I hear the biggest of the roar up to this point. I would guess it is almost as strong as the first. Everyone less than 20 feet away freezes. The monster gets closer to the archer and lifts its front paws high in the air. I know I'm too late, but I still run towards the archer. Greg pushes so hard of the ground I think he activated some type of charge skill. I get closer and Greg manages to just push the paw enough it misses the archer's head by an inch. Elation is short-lived. I see the disaster about to happen. The monster is off balance. He, in slow motion, starts to pitch over while lifting his paw to regain balance. The archer scrambles away as I and Greg put our combined strength to stop the mammoth's fall. He spins and tries to brace the weight with his back. I use my hands trying to calculate the most effective way to assist in the moments before the beast falls. With a roar, we both give our all pushing. A moment later the mammoth is upright. I look in disbelief and I have no idea how we manage that. Everyone steps back to catch their breath. Holy shit. I didn't think that would work. Says the massive man. You must have pretty high strength. You are one to talk. You must have over 20 in strength. I got 23 strength. We revel in our success while keeping a bigger distance from the mammoth. A few people fall back entirely and the guild commander sends replacements in. We get our confidence back and I manage to convince the mammoth I'm the biggest threat with a well-placed axe hit to the ear. Too bad it got stuck in the bone. I try a few times to retrieve but I'm not successful. The mammoth always swinging his head just right and I can't get close enough. Over an hour goes by and everyone takes breaks rotating through. On one of the rotations, I see Alex wielding a spear. I don't know if he changed his weapon but that is no matter. I realize I'm probably the only one that hasn't stopped. My breath is ragged but the mammoth is in an even worse state. I notice it starts to slow down and take a closer look. I sense he stopped to circulate mana in his body. The difference is subtle but I notice the sudden absence. He also has an infusion skill. The skill seems as if it gave him a lot of stamina, but it was limited by his mana pool. We are lucky it wasn't something like a giant lion. Something with such high speed and better maneuverability would have destroyed the village. Over our time fighting him there are a few broken bones and twisted ankles, but everyone finds an unspoken agreement. Pairs of people drag at as fast as they can anyone that gets hurt. This measure saves anyone from more than pain in the hours or days before they are healed up. When he slows, Everyone notices the opportunity and steps in. Axes and spears are the weapons of choice, and I even manage to unlodge my axe from the side of his head. He begins to bleed even more from dozens of different cuts and stabs. The few people that tried to use swords against him found them lacking. After the weapons of choice hit the beast for the thousandth time it finally falls. Expelling his breath, Greg charges and stabs his spear through the eye, into the brain of the beast. At that moment, I knew the beast was dead. I see thrashing but my close attention to the mana tells me there is no longer will behind it. With so little left in the air, I take as big a sample as I can. I hold it in my hand and slowly accumulate it. Greg sees it and asks, So, is that any good? Nah, just mana, but I will be studying it to see if I can learn anything. Another in the group with Greg says, Check your messages. I open and instead of the series of messages I usually see I get a single message. You have participated in a village event. 
The scouts encountered a beast far stronger than they were expecting and did not manage to escape. Enemies 1x Warped Mammoth Average Level 46 Bonus Experience 10x Awarded Experience For your contributions to the battle you have been awarded 2012 EXP 3.26% Looking over it, I figure the total experience was around 60k EXP. Given the EXP bonus, it seems clear the formula for the monster experience was right. It's around 150 EXP per level. If a small group had the right skills and stats, they could have a massive EXP infusion from hunting only a few of these beasts. I wonder at the warped nature of the beast, but don't find a satisfactory answer. I clean the axe's blade and head for the gate. In only 10 minutes, everyone's nerves have settled down and the guild council concludes their talks. I hear Charlie speaking. This is a moment we have to pay attention to. There are many lessons to be learned. I know everybody is tired, so I will be brief. There are many things we will have to analyze and change in the days to come, but at this moment we have two projects that are pressing. We need to repair the gap. We will want to do that in less than an hour if possible. Afterward, we will be making a sturdier and taller wall. It has become clear that our defenses are insufficient. We will do our best to remedy the situation. We want absolutely everyone that doesn't have an essential job to pitch in. We will provide three meals and credit 20 coppers in the contribution ledger for a 12-hour shift. We will attempt to keep the effort 24 hours until we have a wall good enough to withstand several charges from a beast like the Mammoth. We will be starting work now. Those that are going to volunteer form a line here. I see him pointing to the side and people start to move in that direction forming a line. I approach him and he says, Nash, good job out there. If you hadn't pulled the monster so fast, the situation might not have turned out so well. I just gave you guys time to plan properly. It was time we needed. Regardless, you should get back to the smithy. You are one of the few people who can't leave your work for later. It's extremely important to keep pace with our expansion, especially for something so essential as the items you make. I will be going in a minute. I see a couple of people started to wear leather armor. Yes, it takes days for the leather to cure. Only today the first leather armors were available to be bought. I will be going. Do think about what we should be producing at the smithy. I was thinking about some type of ballista. We will go there tonight probably. Talk it over with Mr. Blackwood and see if we can find a good weapon like a ballista. Tired, I walk back going over the man I hold in my hand. I quickly stop by the training hall and see Merlin. Merlin, I absorbed a little of the mana as the beast died. Do you want to take a look? Oh yes. He comes closer and I extend my hand to him. He sends a probe, and after a moment I fell a tug and allow some of the mana to escape my grasp. He has very good control, probably almost as good as mine. He only started this a few days ago. He will surpass me in no time at this rate, I think while grinning. Good, we will need talented people. Guess you can control the mana so it doesn't dissipate any time soon. I will be going to the smithy. Take some more. I send most of the mana, only keeping a tiny amount to test. I head to the smithy testing a few things in the way. This mana has a different signature than any other I have seen before, but that is not surprising. Every single source of mana I have seen has had a different signature. I have felt the mana from a dozen people while infusing wood. I try to gain insight into this particular sample. In the end, I fail miserably. I arrive at the smithy and see Mr. Blackwood working. The other workers came back before me. I enter and say, Everyone is hard at work. Why do I feel I have been slacking? Blackwood replies, if what your colleagues say is even half accurate, you more than deserve your rest. You acted as bait for all this time. And he lifted the mammoth with his bare hands. Says Ryan, the most recent hire. I wasn't alone. Greg did the most work. And I just had the right stats. 21 in endurance is no joke. At these words, I feel like the biggest fool in the world. I forgot to use my free stat points. I wonder on what stat I should put it. Not having decided my path, I leave them sitting there for me to assign later. I simply have to remember, if I fight something like that again, I need to use these points. I see you have some of the mana from the beast. Is it useful for anything? I ask hopefully. It is like any other mana. Studying it may give a better understanding of mana, but not more than any other type you have not encountered before. At higher levels, it can be a component to create weapons, but for now, it's of little use. Any other pearls of wisdom? I say dispersing the mana. Don't waste the mana. I quickly reacquire control of it. He continues speaking, put it in the blower. At that, I laugh and from a few feet away, I send a tendril of mana from the mammoth to the input plate. All of it enters the air blower. That does give me some ideas. 
We can probably store mana partially in fusing wood and they would not even need to come to the forge. Imagine a mana-based economy. Everybody walks around carrying wood coins in their pocket. If the coins were empty, they could just charge enough mana when they need to pay something. The richest person would, in a literal fashion, be burning money as they cast spells using the mana and the coins. That is a though, can I cast spells with mana that hasn't come from me? I know I can infuse it, but it is not the same thing. I need to think about it and experiment. I finish catching my breath and settle working alongside everyone else. Chapter 20 I sit staring the infused wood deeply disappointed. After an hour of frantic work, I go search for Dimitri. After finding him, I discover what I feared was true. The process of infusion most people are using is faulty. Nobody noticed it up to this moment, but now I see the problem. An hour after infusion, you lose half of the mana. After 12 hours, you're only left with about 10%. The previous times, I find strange the very different amounts of mana in each of the locks. Still, I didn't pay attention to it. This time, however, something clicked in my mind. The dreams of storing mana for later use are all crushed. Perhaps I could store them another way, but this easy avenue is closed. The process I use for the final mana infusion seems like a good method to store mana for longer. I extract tiny amounts of pure mana from wood and find. After some experimentation, I can cast spells with it. When I finish it, I attempt to absorb the smallest sliver of mana and the world goes black. I awake only a moment later, but I can feel the damage I made. I take an internal look with my ether and mana sense. I see the interrupted and torn channels in my body. I guess these would normally be the way mana flows through me. The little mana I had in my body must have reacted violently with what I absorbed. Luckily, I only tried to absorb a tenth of a point of mana. Five or ten points would probably be enough to kill me. I really should have listened to the instinct I had the previous time and not have tried to absorb mana. Perhaps there are ways to do so, but for now, I will stick with casting without absorbing. I open my stats and go over it. These notifications in my habit to accumulate OM any at a time is getting ridiculous. This should be organized for maximum efficiency. It shouldn't be a long list of repeated words. I meditate for a few minutes and my internals stabilize. It has been a while. I should take a look at my Bach. There are two new pages. These new runes could be very useful. Six new runes, along with better explanations on connecting runes. I look over it and realize these new runes are different from the previous ones. Now I have a third category. I spend some time meticulously going over everything. After some experimentation, I should be able to create more complex spells. I could probably make it work with a single rune if I throw enough mana at it, but I think there must be significant advantages for constructing an actual spell. I wait for the debuff to end and start my experimentation. I try to keep mana costs as low as I possibly can, but I'm out in less than 10 minutes. With a last longing look, I try to commit every single one to memory. I will need to explore more on this subject. Looking for Merlin in the training yard is a butt. He is asleep in his cot, and I don't want to wake him up. I leave and think about what would be the best use of my time. I think over my stats and decide to attempt to increase them. At the wall, I see things moving at an unbelievable pace. About a hundred people are working. Six hours have passed since the attack. The wall has been repaired in the destroyed spot. The gate is now 6 meters tall and there are reinforcements not only tying the logs together, but also at 45 degrees angles bracing the whole structure. I also see a section, 200 meters long already up. They made the new walls significantly taller. In the place the new walls are up, I see that there is extra bracing and both the old and the new logs are tied together. I look over it with a critical eye. From an engineering standpoint, the rope is not good enough to make full use of the strength of the logs. With our resources, however, it's the best we can do. The saw I helped make earlier looks to be very useful. A pair of guys cut through the wood at an unbelievable pace. I think their pace is faster than someone with a chainsaw. That doesn't make much sense in my mind, but we are not on Earth and the system changed all the rules. At the site, I find Charlie talking with someone. I wait a moment, and before he has the chance to attend other business, I say to him, The work seems to be going well. The bandsaw seems to be a big help. Yes, it is a godsend. I just hope they don't break it. They seem to be taking care of it. Regardless, how are things after the attack? Everybody healed up? Yes, there is only one person that still isn't fully healed, and even then he can walk already. That is good. We were not prepared for this attack. It could have been so much worse. We need to increase training for battle coordination. We should probably organize everyone that knows how to fight and run a couple of drills. The situation could have been really bad. 
We will also start getting more guards. We should probably also get a horn in case of attack. Yeah, that would have been more organized and timely than run around yelling, attack, attack dot. He laughs and asks, Anything in specific you wanted to discuss? Yes, there are two things. I want to start tomorrow to run the forge around the clock. You know what we will need. You can handle all that. I will be sending you eight people we have selected. Good. I heard about your classes. I want to teach one as well. They need to be willing to donate half their mana to me, so I can use it. That is my only requirement. Okay. I will set it up. When people hear about it, everyone will want to attend. What will you be teaching? I have a few new runes and I started to make sense of them. I will focus mostly on the use of runes and attempting to explore into combinations as my mana allows. Okay. I got to be on my way. One last thing, we will need to set a schedule so everyone infusing mana will do it with me there. The mana dissipates too quickly. I heard about that just now. We really should have paid more attention. We say goodbye in part ways. I head to the wood piling up near the busiest field and start carrying the logs to the wall. Even with my tiredness from the earlier exertions, I push as close to my limit as I can. My pace is faster than most people here. I end up carrying alone what most people are carrying in pairs or trios. Sweat drips from my body and I can feel my muscles burning. I spend the rest of the night almost in trance. This reminds me of the work I did on Pando too much. I wake up when the sun is coming up. Even though I sleep so little, I rested very well. The system seems to make sleep more effective. Most people are already sleeping 5 hours a night. I wonder what are the parameters governing our need for sleep in the system. It could be stats, level, time after integration, and half a dozen other things I haven't thought of. I get on with my day and skip the mayor's speech. I get there right at the end and listen to Charlie starting. Our efforts to fortify the wall are going well. If we keep the pace, we will be able to finish the 700 meters of walls that are in the most danger. That should finish by tonight. After that, we will be reinforcing the walls on the cliff edge. We don't have plans to make it taller, but we will build towers all around to serve as watchtowers. If we finish early enough, tonight we will be having a celebration. We managed to get a few barrels of beer and wine. There is enough everybody can have half a glass. We meet at the inn salon. If we finish it too late, we will postpone to tomorrow. At that, everybody cheer. This is a good way to make sure it finishes today. It's a brilliant move for multiple reasons. If we kept going at this pace without some rest, everyone would start to burn out. There are a few things I would like to bring up. One is a discovery from a team of hunters a few hours ago. Only seven kilometers away, we have found a mine. The ore brought back is probably iron. We will be analyzing the ore and the surroundings to see if there are any other metals. This is a very important step in our self-sufficiency. We have taken to try test possible alternative defense methods. Yesterday, the last ingredient of gunpowder was found and to our surprise, it failed. We have two experienced people who made gunpowder for historical reenacting. We also have a chemist teacher. We assume it is unlikely the problem would be improper manufacturing. Our best guess is system interference. The hour before we were brought here, most electronics a few other pieces of tech stopped working. We don't have anyone in the village who shot a fire weapon after system integration. Even the people who armed themselves didn't test if guns still worked. It's not something we ever thought would change. On another news, we found out what happens when you hit level 10. The leveling process stops. At this level, you need to unlock and chose a class. You don't lose any experience if you hunt. Meanwhile, the experience just sits on your stat screen. Nobody has unlocked a class yet. That means we don't have more information. We hope we will begin to unlock classes in the coming days. That was all for today. I think about the classes. I wonder if the council messed with it to screw us over. After a moment I laugh. Of course they did. They will push as much as they can get away with. Maybe the book will cooperate and tell me about it soon. With a thousand things running through my mind I go to work. At the smithy, first thing in the morning we start to make the metal parts for the ballista. Smith came last night and we talked a little with the smith. He gave us a few options, and we ended up going for the ballista. He will make the metal parts, and they will ask for the wood parts from the carpenter. We mentioned doing it on our own, but he recommended not to. I think it over and realize it may lower the damage bonus. Or it may not be as reliable. Any mistake might get us killed before we even realize what we did wrong. I pay attention to every action from Mr. Blackwood. He makes three sets, and for the last one, I'm deep in meditation to blow air in the forge. That heats it up quite a bit and allows for better and stronger items. I'm still trying to figure out the mechanics behind the whole process. 
This time, only an hour in, and I come back. I see Mr. Blackwood starting the grinding process. I have been wondering why he lets me stay on the mana plate long after he has finished the hammering process. He doesn't need a hotter forge to grind and polish the items into shape. It is probably because of system interference. The exercise is really good for my mana manipulation skill. We finished the four ballistae in time for lunch. They still lack the wood framework, but even now they look impressive. When everyone leaves for a quick lunch, he forges very basic and quick items. They are the tips for the ballista bolts. We work side by side and make two dozen in less than half an hour. They are quick and dirty jobs but are good enough for the ballisti. The new workers spend a few hours in the afternoon getting used to the rhythm of the smithy. They ask lots of questions and pace about, but as long as they don't get in anybody's way, Mr. Blackwood won't shoo them away. Most people loitering at the shop are invited to come back the next day. He probably just doesn't want people getting in the way of our work. The new arrivals, even if they are not official workers for him, will be learning to forge. It seems he doesn't seem to mind them in this case. The day ends and after our pay and giving most of it back we are left with piles of metal. Before he leaves we hear. Now, I'm trusting the forge to you. You all will have to pay for anything you break. Before everyone that was in my smithy were you. Now there are new people that I didn't bring in. Depending on what you break, the cost would bankrupt the village. The others look a bit perplexed, so I volunteer. You guys know the thinnest saw on the bench? The one for really fine work. That saw costs 50 gold to replace the mithril filament. Hearing that, they all bulge their eyes out. The smith continues. Exactly. I know accidents happen, but depending on what is broken, my hands are tied. He gives all of us a meaningful look. Shit. The system trying to screw us over again? After a half hour and the eight new workers start to settle in, I leave. We decided on a schedule. Each of us will work half the night every other day. I was the only one not with another person, so I would have to guide every on my own, but I didn't mind. I leave and head for my class. I think of the possibilities this opens up. If everything works out, I will greatly speed up my learning speed. At a run, I pass through the city, towards a new chapter in my story. On the other side of the galaxy, a sentient being was alone. The only one is kind on the whole planet. Over two seasons had passed after the arrival of the Winds of Change. Pando was more aware than ever. With each new trial, he grew in ways he could not properly determine. The practical effects were that he was stronger, grew faster, and could spend longer and longer with his mind aware of things. Things that were far different from the concerns he used to have. It used to be, he couldn't spend more than a second or two thinking of anything other than the soil, the sun, or the rain. For millennia, he only thought of things as they happened. As his moving friends started to interact more with him, he managed to slowly be able to grasp abstract concepts. The system arrival was a giant catalyst. Now he could grow much faster than ever before. He managed to connect every single tree Nash had planted with his root system. He was trying to increase the speed of his growth. Thin strands of roots even unrolled themselves over the ground to connect the saplings growing. Soon after, he created redundant lines underground. The whole endeavor was worth it because it accelerated his growth. His trials were also getting harder and harder. When the sun was the highest in the sky, the next trial would start. After a few minutes, rabid wolves started to come in. A few of the animals that made Pando their sanctuary tried to take down a few of the packs but were not successful. These wolves, unlike what would be expected, ignored the animals after incapacitating them. Pando sends a thin stream of vigor to all the animals to make sure they didn't become soil food. It's his best if they keep moving around. Pando tries to fill one of the wolves to bursting with vigor. The wolf just starts to twitch a little. The wolves head straight for the smaller saplings. Biting and even managing to almost break clean off a few, the wolves convulse and died. The wolf filled with vigor lasts for another few seconds. He pulls the sapling with all his strength and manages to rip off the last few strands of fiber. Triumphant he stands back and weakly howls before dying. The trials, as time has passed, started getting longer. For hours new packs of three or four wolves show up. With fewer wolves and more spread out, Pando's inhabitants are more successful. Filled with copious amounts of vigor they fight and the losses are few and far between. The day ends and a dozen saplings are ruined. Without understanding the mechanics but an expert on it by now, Pando sends a stream of ether out and the wolves go through an accelerated decomposition process. It takes only days until they are soil food. Heal. Grow. Defend. Learn. Heal. Grow. Defend. Learn.